Thank you. Hello, my name is Frankie. I work also with an organization called the Zeitgeist Movement, as you already know. And yeah, I'd like to welcome everybody right here. And from far and wide, everybody did come. Thank you very much. And um, I'd like to take this opportunity to especially thank the teams of the Zeitgeist Movement. Teams meaning the linguistic team, the web team, the technology team, the activism team, and also, of course, the project team that coordinate this project right here. Um, the whole German chapter did a huge, great job with establishing this event right here within a month. So I'd like to thank everybody personally, and yeah, good to see you here. Um, I think Peter Joseph don't need any introduction. I think everybody knows right here who he is. So yeah, short and precise, thank you. And I hand the mic over to Peter. <laughs> Ah, so that's the other guy. <laughs> How's everybody doing? Good. I really appreciate you all being here. Um, and I want to thank Frankie and the Berlin team for moving so fast. It's really phenomenal. Having put on many events myself over the years, it's not an easy task. And I'm always reminded when I travel these days uh, that the Zeitgeist Movement is truly a global phenomenon at this stage, right? And no matter where any of us end up on the planet, you don't have to go very far to find friends who share similar values in this pursuit of a better world. The title of this talk is Economic Calculation in a Natural Law Resource-Based Economy. For the past five years or so, the Zeitgeist Movement has put out quite a bit of educational media with respect to its advocation. And the learning curve has been rather intense, and there's been a tendency to generalize with respect to how things actually work technically. This is the contents of this presentation, and in part one and two, I'm going to refine the inherent flaws of the current market model regarding why we need to change, along with relaying the vast prospects we now have to solve vast problems, improve efficiency, and generate a form of abundance that could meet all human needs. The active term, which has gained a good deal of popularity in the past couple of years, is called post-scarcity, even though that word is a little bit misleading semantically, as I'll explain. And in part three, I will work to show how this new society generally works in its structure and basic calculation. I think most people on the planet know that there's something very wrong with the current socioeconomic tradition. They just don't know how to think about the solution, or more accurately, how to arrive at such solutions. And until that is addressed, we're not going to get very far. And on that note, in a number of months, a rather substantial text is going to be put into circulation, available for free, and also in print form or download form at cost. It's a nonprofit expression. Uh, this will be finished hopefully by the first of the year, and this will be the definitive expression, at least in the condensed form, of the movement, something that's been long overdue. It's called the Zeitgeist Movement Defined, and it will serve as both an orientation and a reference guide, uh, and we'll have probably over a thousand footnotes and sources. Once finished, an educational video series will be put out in about 20 parts to reduce the material, along with a workbook to help people that want to learn how to talk about these ideas, because we basically need more people in, on an international level to be able to communicate, as I try to do. And it's a very important thing, and I think the movement, basically the future of the movement, I should say, rests in part on our capacity to create a well-oiled international educational machine with consistent language coupled with real design projects and their interworkings. Part one, so why are we even here? Is this type of large scale change what the movement advocates really needed? Can't we just work to fix and improve the current economic model, keeping the general framework of money, trade, profit, power, property and the like? The short answer is a definitive no, as I'm going to explain. If there is any real interest to solve the growing public health and environmental crises at hand, this system needs to go. Market capitalism, no matter how you wish to regulate it or not regulate it, depending on who you speak with, contains severe structural flaws which will always, to one degree or another, perpetuate environmental abuse and destabilization 
and human disregard and caustic inequality. Put another way, environmental and social imbalance and a basic lack of sustainability both environmentally and culturally is inherent to the market economy and it always has been. The difference between capitalism today and say the 16th century is that our technological ability to rapidly accelerate and amplify this market process has brought to the surface consequences which simply couldn't be understood or even recognized during those early primitive times. In other words, the basic principles of market economics have always been intrinsically flawed. It has taken just this long for the severity of those flaws to come to fruition. So let me explain a little bit. From an environmental standpoint, market perception simply could not view the earth as anything but an inventory for exploitation. Why? Because the entire existence of the market economy has to do with keeping money in circulation at a rate which can keep as many people employed as possible. In other words, the world economy is powered by constant consumption. If consumption levels drop, so does labor demand, and so does the available purchasing power of the general population, and hence, so does demand for goods, as money isn't there to buy them. This cyclical consumption is the lifeblood of our economic existence. And the very idea of being conservative or truly efficient with the Earth's finite resources in any way is structurally counterproductive to this needed driving force of consuming. And if you don't believe that, ask yourself why virtually every life support system on this planet is in decline. We have an ongoing loss of topsoil, ever depleting freshwater, atmospheric and climate destabilization, a loss of oxygen producing plankton in the ocean, which is critical to marine and atmosphere ecology, the ongoing depletion of fish populations, the reduction of rainforests, and so forth. In other words, an overall general loss of critical biodiversity is occurring and increasing. And for those not familiar with the critical relevance of biodiversity, billions of years of evolution has created a vastly interdependent biosphere of planetary systems, and disturbing one system always has an effect on many others. And this, of course, is no new observation. In 2002, 192 countries, in association with the United Nations, got together around something called the Convention on Biological Diversity, and they made a public commitment to significantly reduce this loss by 2010. And what changed eight years later? Nothing. In their official 2010 publication, they state, none of the 21 sub-targets accompanying the overall target of significantly in reducing the, the rate of bio biodiversity loss by 2010 can be said definitively to have been achieved globally. Actions to promote biodiversity receive a tiny fraction of funding compared to infrastructure and industrial developments. Hmm, I wonder why. Moreover, biodiversity considerations are often ignored when such developments are designed. Most future scenarios project continuing high levels of extinctions and loss of habitats throughout this century. In a 2011 study published, which was in part a response to an overall general call to isolate and protect certain regions to ensure some security of this biodiversity, found that even with millions of square kilometers of land and ocean currently under legal protection, it has done very little to slow the trend of decline. They also made the following highly troubling conclusion, combining this trend with the state of our resource consumption. The excess use of the Earth's resources or overshoot is possible because resources can be harvested faster than they can be replaced. The cumulative overshoot from the mid-1980s to 2002 resulted in an ecological debt that would require 2.5 planet Earths to pay. In a business-as-usual scenario, our demands on planet Earth could mount to the productivity of 27 planets by 2050. And there's no shortage of other corroborating studies that confirm, to one degree or another, we are indeed greatly overshooting the annual production capacity of the Earth, coupled with pollution and collateral destruction caused by industrial and consumer patterns. Again, 
This kind of research has been published for many decades now. And why is it that with all this mounting data, we can't seem to curb life support depletion and our overshooting consumption trends? Is it because there are too many people on the planet? Is it because we're just utterly incompetent and have no conscious control over our actions? No. The problem is that we have a global economic tradition still in place, rooted in 16th century pre-industrial handicraft-oriented thought that places the act of consuming, buying and selling as the core driver of all social unfolding. The best analogy I can think of is to consider the gas pedal on a car. The more consumption of fuel, the faster it goes, and buying things in our world is the fuel. If you slow down consumption, economic growth slows, people lose jobs, purchasing power declines, and things become destabilized and so forth. So I hope it is clear that the system simply does not reward or even support environmental sustainability in the form of conservation. In fact, it doesn't even reward sustainability in the form of any kind of earthly or physical efficiency, as I will talk more at length of in a moment. Instead, it, re it rewards servicing, turnover and waste, the more problems and inefficiencies we have, not to mention the more insecure, materialistic and needy the population becomes, the better it is for industry, the better it is for GDP, the better it is for employment, regardless of the fact that we may literally be killing ourselves in the process. My friend John McMurtry, a philosopher in Canada, refers to this state as the cancer stage of capitalism, a system which is now destroying its host, us and the earth, almost unknowingly because very few today really understand how unsustainable the core driving principles of the market really are. The second structurally inherent consequence I want to mention is the fact that market capitalism is indeed empirically socially destabilizing. It creates unnecessary and inhumane inequality along with resulting unnecessary human conflict. In fact, I would say capitalism's most natural state is conflict and imbalance. And I would categorize two forms of conflict in the world, national and class. I'm not going to spend much time on the causes of national warfare, as it should be fairly obvious to most of us at this point. Sovereign nations, which are in part protectionist institutions for the most powerful forces of business, have often engaged in the most primal act of competition, systematic mass murder, in order to preserve the economic integrity of their national economies and select business interests, which invariably comprise the political constituency of any given country. All wars in history, while often conveniently masked by various excuses, have predominantly been about land, natural resources, or geo-economic strategy on one level or another. The state institution has always been driven by commercial and property interests, existing as both a regulator of the basic day-to-day -day internal economic operations in the form of legislation, and as a tool for power consolidation and competitive advantage by the most dominant industries of the national or even, in fact, more importantly, global economy. And of course, there are many people in the world that still look at this causality in reverse. In some economic views, state government is deemed the central problem, as opposed to the self-interest and competitive advantage-seeking ethos inherent to market capitalism. As the argument goes, if state power was removed or reduced dramatically, the market and society would be free of most of its negative effects. The problem with this argument is that it forgets that capitalism is just a variation of a scarcity-driven specialization and property-based exchange system, a system which actually goes back millennia in one form or another. Early settlements naturally needed to protect themselves as resource and land acquisition moved forward over time. Armies were created to protect resources from invading forces and the like. At the same time, people were working to engage, ag engage agriculture and handicraft, and it revealed labor and exchange value in the form, in a very primitive form. Hence, property value in the midst of this scarcity demanded regulation and laws, not only to protect property, but to protect commerce and also avoid scams and fraud in transactions. 
This is the seed of the state. The market is a game and people can cheat. You need regulation. This is the basic problem. The market also allows, and here's the punchline, that regulation to be purchased by money. Therefore, there is no guaranteed integrity. The state and the market both battle each other and complement each other. You will always have regulatory power centers in a market economy. The state and the market are inseparable. They go hand in hand. Now, as an aside, people often challenge this reality with moral or ethical arguments, which I'm sorry to say are entirely culturally subjective. In a world where everything is for sale, where the reward reinforcement, the operant condition, is directly tied to seeking personal advantage and gain, who is to say where the lines should be drawn in that process? This is why moral principles without structural reinforcement are useless. In the end, the question isn't what is morally right or what is morally wrong. The question is what works and what doesn't. And sometimes it takes a great deal of time for the truth of such patterns to materialize. For example, most people, rightly so, see abject human slavery historically as a morally wrong condition. But let's dig deeper into the characteristics and think more deeply. I think it is much more productive to recognize that slavery didn't work in the sense that it was culturally unsustainable. Bigotry in all forms is not just ugly, it is culturally unsustainable because it generates conflict. I'm not aware of any slave-owning society that did not undergo large slave rebellions. It's unstable and again, therefore, unsustainable. And market capitalism is on the same path. There are more slaves in the world today operating within the bounds of the market economy than any time in human history. And I have little doubt that if we get through this rough period of time without destroying ourselves by war, uprisings, or ecological collapse, people in the future will look back at our world today with the same disgust regarding our human rights violating economic system as we today look back upon the period of abject human slavery. Class warfare. This leads us well into the subject of class warfare and socioeconomic inequality. The long history of so-called socialist outcry has largely been about this constant and inhumane imbalance on one level or another. A great deal of time has been spent by many critics of capitalism describing how it is indeed a system of exploitation, which inherently separates a society into stratified economic layers with a higher class given dominance over the lower structurally. It's structurally built right in. And if you're one of those people that doesn't agree with this reality, ask yourself why there has been one labor strike after another in the past 300 years, why worker unions even exist, why CEOs often tend to make hundreds of times more money than the common worker, or why 46% of the world's wealth is now owned by 1% which are almost exclusively of what we could call the capitalist ownership class. Inequality and class separation is a direct mathematical result of the market's inherently competitive orientation, which divides individuals and in small groups as they work to compete against each other for survival and security. It is entirely individualistically oriented, driven by a core incentive system based around isolated self-preservation assuming the need to constantly reinforce one's security financially, since the market climate, the environment gives no certainty whatsoever of well-being in and of itself. Fear and greed. The rich get richer because the model favors them and the poor basically stay the same because the system works against them by comparison. It is structurally classed. Those with more money have more options and influence than those with less. You are only as free as they say as your purchasing power will allow you to be. And the credit system is a perfect example. Money is treated as nothing more than a product in the, in the credit system, in the banking system. Money is sold by banks via loans for profit, which comes in the form of interest. If you miss payments or violate your contract, often the interest rate does what? It goes up because you are now considered a higher risk consumer. If you fail to meet that interest or future payments, you might default on the loan. You punish, your punishment, excuse me, 
is the ruining of your credit rating or reputation in the financial circles. And once that happens, your financial flexibility is even more stifled as your economic access is limited. This, people see this as the way things are, but they don't realize how insidious this is. This compounds the lower classes to stay low for reasons and forces of coercion that are built, built into the structure that are beyond their control. And I could give many other examples. Everything in this system works against you if you're not affluent in this society. And guess what? These financial policies were created by self-interested, self-interest, I should say, oriented market logic, not some politician or some government. And I won't even go into the fact that the interest charged for the sale of money today doesn't even exist in the money supply itself, which creates a kind of system-based social coercion, forcing the inevitability of credit default over time along with acts of economic desperation, such as selling property you rather would not uh, to meet your basic needs, or taking labor positions, of course, that you do not appreciate. The market generates desperation as its method of coercion. And this is, leads into another very common free market confusion I often see in the very popular laissez-faire community. They talk about free trade as trade that is entirely voluntary, as though such a thing could ever exist in an empirical sense. All decisions to trade come from influences and pressures. Only perhaps the super rich, who literally have no need to worry about basic survival due to their wealth, could possibly be said to engage in the act of voluntary free trade. For 99% of the world, we either trade or we don't survive. And that pressure is empirically coercive. And no, it doesn't have to be that way, which is the whole point of this new social model. So with all that aside, and with this understanding that wealth inequality is inherent to capitalism itself, you can't regulate it out, the main issue I want to address here has to do with what class separation and social inequality does to us in the context of public health. It isn't just a simple issue of some having more than others and others suffering the mere material inconvenience or pressure to engage in labor or trade they would rather not have to. It goes way beyond that. Socioeconomic inequality is a poison, a form of destabilizing pollution that affects people's psychological and physiological health in profound ways, while also very often accumulating anger towards other groups and hence that generation of social instability. The best term I know of that embodies this issue is structural violence. If I put a gun to someone's head, say a 30-year-old healthy male, and pull the trigger and kill him, assuming an average life expectancy of, say, 84, you can argue that possibly 54 years of life was stolen from that person in a direct act of violence. However, if a person is born into poverty, in the midst of an abundant society where it is statistically proven that it would hurt no one to facilitate meeting the basic needs of that person, and yet they die at the age of 30 due to heart disease, which has been found to statistically relate to those who endure the stress and effects of low socioeconomic status, is that death, the removal of those 54 years once again, an act of violence? And the answer is yes, it is. You see, our legal system has conditioned us to think that violence is a direct behavioral act. The truth is that violence is a process, not an act, and it can take many forms. You cannot separate any outcome from the system by which it is oriented. And again, this is virtually absent from the way people think about cause and effect in a socioeconomic system. The effects of market capitalism cannot be reduced or as I should say, cannot be deduced logically from local or reductionist examination. It's like things are working like a clock. The market is a synergistic system. The economy is a synergistic system. And the behavior of the whole, meaning large scale social consequences, such as the perpetuation of inequality or violence, can only be assessed in relationship to that whole. This is why there has been one big dichotomy between what market theorists think is supposed to happen in their world and what is actually happening. For example, there is no doubt that poverty and social inequity is and has been causing a vast spectrum of public health problems. 
both in the context of absolute deprivation, which means not having the money to simply meet up with basic needs, such as nutrition, and in the context of relative deprivation, which is a psychological phenomenon related to the stress, the psychosocial stress of simply living in a highly stratified society. One of the greatest predictors of reduced public health is now to be found as social inequity, social inequality. If you compare developed nations by the level of wealth inequality, you will find that those more equal nations have much better health than those with less equality. This includes physical health, mental health, drug abuse, educational levels, imprisonment, obesity, social mobility, trust or social capital, community life, violence, teen pregnancies, and child well-being on average. These outcomes are significantly worse in more unequal rich countries. And yet, again, if you try to reduce and analyze a single person for any of these noted public health factors, you could never know for sure if that person is actually a victim of the psychostress or the absolute or relative violence condition itself. The causality can only be understood on the large scale probabilistically, which is the importance of statistic and statistical analysis. So again, the market can only be perceived as a whole to gauge the truth of its effects. This is why our legal system, of course, uh, is so base and primitive. Now, that aside, I would like to detail a few more examples of structural violence, as it obviously takes many more forms. When we see 1.5 million children die each year from diarrheal diseases, an utterly preventable problem that isn't resolved due to a financial limitation across the world, we are seeing the murder of 1.5 children by a system that is so inefficient in its process, it cannot make the proper resources available in certain regions, even though that they are there. Drug addiction, which has become a plague of modern society across the world, not only causing death, but also a spectrum of suffering, has been found to have roots in stress. It has to do with a lack of support, which creates a psychological chain reaction that leads to fill your feelings of pain with self-medication. You will rarely find a study on addiction patterns that does not see a direct correlation to unstable life conditions and stress. And what is perhaps poverty's most dominant psychological feature? Feelings of insecurity and humility. Even the vast majority of behavioral violence as we know it arises due to preconditions which have been tied to poverty-induced deprivation and abuse. Former head of the study of violence at Harvard, Dr. James Gilligan, was a prison psychiatrist for many decades, analyzing the reasons for extreme acts of murder and the like. In virtually all cases, high levels of deprivation, neglect, and abuse occurred in the life history of the offenders. And guess what? Poverty is the single best predictor of child abuse and neglect. In a United States study, children who lived in families with an annual income less than 15,000 are 22 times more likely to be abused or neglected than children living in families with an annual income of 30,000 or more. Aristotle said, poverty is the parent of revolution and crime. Gandhi said, poverty is the worst form of violence. And the interesting thing about all this is, is that we are all possible victims of its effects, for every time you hear about an act of theft, violence, murder, or the like, chances are the origins of that behavior were born out of a preventable form of deprivation. I say preventable because today there is absolutely no technical reason for any human being to live in poverty and resource deprivation. Solving social inequality is not just a nice thing to do. It is a true public health imperative just like making sure our water isn't polluted so we don't get diseases. And each of us have no idea when we might be subjected to, say, the violence bred by this deprivation. It's a form of blowback, if you will. Just like how some social theorists think about the reasons for modern terrorism from abused countries, a country like the United States bombs some town, the people in that town lose everything. Certain people are deeply affected and find no other emotional recourse but to act in the most violent way they can in revenge. And the next thing you know, a bomb explodes at a coffee shop in your city, killing your sibling. 
In short, if you want to produce a violent criminal or gang mentality, let them be raised in an environment where they are reinforced with the sense that society doesn't care about them, and hence they have no need to care about society. This is the trademark, this is the core characteristic of the capitalist social order. And as a final aside before I move on, I find it incredibly interesting that the vast majority of the civil rights institutions today, or human rights institutions today, which still demand more race, uh, gender, creed, and political equality, tend to do very little to address the roots of economic inequality. Uh, it's a very interesting contradiction. I'm firmly convinced that as time moves forward, economic equality will morph into the same role as gender and race equality, where meeting human needs and facilitating a high standard of living will be an issue of human rights, not market experience, expedience, excuse me. Sorry, there's social Darwinism to which it is based. Part two, post-scarcity. I would like to spend a moment clarifying what an abundance-focused society actually means and give some tangible statistical extrapolations to confirm this potential. A natural law, resource-based economy is not a utopia. The Zeitgeist Movement seeks a high, relative, sustainable abundance, relieving the most relevant forms of scarcity. Of course, many who hear such distinctions immediately dismiss such qualifications as mere opinion, right? The fact is, it's not opinion when it comes to life support or empirical human needs. Relative, sustainable abundance means seeking more than enough to meet all human needs and beyond while keeping ecological balance. The most relevant forms of scarcity means we differentiate between scarcity as it relates to human needs and scarcity as it relates to human wants, as they are not the same. Unfortunately, market logic pretends that they are, right? The market cannot separate needs from wants. And this gets to the root of the life-blind value system disorder which continues to distort our culture. The logic goes like this. If there exists any form of scarcity of anything on any level, then we need money in the competitive market to regulate it. Let me explain this a little bit more. One of our international lecture team members, Matt Berkowitz, did a radio interview with a very popular Austrian economist a little while back. And when the subject of scarcity came up, this economist responded with, not everyone can have a fancy steak or a Ferrari. This was his definitive view of what scarcity means. Now that may be true. Not every human being can have a 500 room mansion with three jets parked in the front lawn with half the continent of Africa as his or her backyard. You see, in theory, we could conjure up anything and use such luxury-based scarcity defenses to support the existence of the competitive market. So what are human needs? Are they subjective? Human needs have been created by the process of our physical and psychological evolution. And not meeting these virtually empirical needs results, as noted before, in a statistically predictable, destabilizing spectrum of physical, mental, and social disorders. Human wants, on the other hand, are cultural manifestations, which have undergone enormous subjective change over the course of time, revealing in truth something of an arbitrary nature. Now, this isn't to say neurotic attachments can't be made to wants, so, so much so that they start to take the role of needs. Uh, that's, that's a phenomenon that occurs readily in our materialistic society, in fact. Uh, and this is exactly why the previously noted wealth imbalance, imbalance issues, namely the psychosocial stress response resulting from social comparison, is what it is. It's a part of our evolutionary psychology in many ways. But this is partly why more unequal societies also are the more unhealthy societies, because we perpetuate it. So the Zeitgeist Movement is not promoting an infinite universal abundance of all things, which is clearly impossible on a finite planet. Rather, it promotes a post-scarcity or abundance worldview with an active recognition of the natural limits of consumption on the planet while seeking equilibrium. 
And what separates the world today from the world of the past is that our scientific and technological capacity has reached an accelerating point of efficiency. We're creating a high standard of living for all the world's people based on current cultural preferences, in fact, is now possible within these sustainable boundaries without the destructive need to compete through the market mechanism. This is made by what has been called ephemeralization, a term coined by engineer R. Buckminster Fuller. And the recognition is very simple. The amount of resources and energy needed to achieve any given task has constantly decreased over time, while the efficiency of that task has increased paradoxically. An example is wireless satellite communication, which uses exponentially less materials than traditional large gauge copper wire, and of course is more versatile and effective. In other words, we are doing more with less continually. And this trend can be noticed in all areas of industrial development, from computer processing or Moore's law, to the rapid acceleration of human knowledge or information, te information technology. Excuse me. And it isn't just physical goods. It also applies to processes or systems. For example, the labor system via automation today shows the exact same pattern. Industry has become more productive with less people, ever increasing machine performance with ever decreasing energy and material needs over time per operation. Now, as a brief tangent, some might have noticed I keep saying this word or this phrase, high standard of living. What does that mean? Who is to say what a high standard of living should be? The answer to that question is not who, it is what. And what determines our standard of living is the current state of technology in many ways. And what is required to keep, of course, social and environmental sustainability on a finite planet. That's basically the equation. If we as a society wish to keep the value of constant materialism, growth, and consumption, promoting the virtue of having infinite wants, then we might as well just kill ourselves right now. As that is going to be the end result if we continue to push past the limits of the physical world with respect to our resource exploitation and the loss of biodiversity. So I want to make it very clear. This new economic proposal isn't just about seeing how the market is obsolete per se, given our new power powerful awarenesses of technical efficiency. It is also about the fact that we need to get out of the market paradigm as fast as we can before it causes even more damage. OK, post-scarcity. The four categories I want to cover in detail regarding this are food, water, energy, and material goods. And please note that for food, energy, and water, this is actually a very conservative assessment. Using statistics and measures based only on existing methods that have been put into industrial use, not theoretical things that people talk about all the time. And all I'm going to do is scale this out, applying a systems theory context. Food. According to the United Nations, one out of every eight people on Earth, nearly one billion people suffer from chronic undernourishment. Yet it is admitted that there is enough food produced today by traditional market methods alone to provide everyone in the world with at least 2,720 kilocalories per day, which is more than enough to maintain basic health for most. Therefore, just in principle right now, the existence of such a large scale number of chronically hungry people reveals at a minimum that there is something fundamentally wrong with the global industrial and economic process. According to the Institution of Mechanical Engineers, quote, it is estimated that 30 to 50% of all food produced never reaches a human stomach. And this figure does not reflect the fact that large amounts of land, energy, fertilizers, and water have also been lost in the production of foodstuffs which simply end up as waste. And while there is certainly an imperative to consider the relevance of these waste patterns, it appears that the most effective and practical means to overcome this global deficiency entirely is to update the system of food production itself with the most strategic localization in order to reduce the waste caused by inefficiencies in the current global supply chain. And perhaps the most promising of these arrangements is something called vertical farming, which I assume many are familiar with. Vertical farming has been put to test in a number of regions with extremely promising results regarding efficiency and conservation. This method of abundant food production will not only use less resources per unit output, causing less waste, 
have a reduced ecological footprint, increase food quality and the like. It will also use less surface of the, surface of the planet, it uses less land area than we're doing today. It can even be done offshore. It's that versatile. Enabling types of food as well that uh, certain climates and regions simply couldn't produce because it's enclosed. A vertical farm system in Singapore, for example, custom built a transparent enclosure, uses a closed loop automated hydraulic system to rotate the crops in circles between sunlight and an organic nutrient treatment, costing only about $3 a month in electricity for each enclosure. This system also is reported to have 10 times more productivity per square foot than conventional farming. Again, using much less water, labor, and fertilizer. Students at Columbia University in the US determined that in order to feed 50,000 people, a 30-story farm built on the size of a basic city block would be needed, which is about 6.4 acres. If we extrapolate this in the context of the city of Los Angeles, California, where I'm coming from, with a population of about 4 million, with a total acreage of about 318,000, it would take roughly 78 structures to feed all residents. This amounts to about 0.1% of the total land area of Los Angeles to feed the entire population. If we apply this extrapolation to the Earth and the human population of 7.2 billion, we end up needing about 144,000 vertical farms to feed the whole world. This amounts to about 921,000 acres of land to place these farms, which, given about 38% of the Earth's land is currently being used for traditional agriculture, we find that we only need about 0.006% of the Earth's existing agricultural land to meet production requirements. Of course, let's be a little bit more consistent. Within that 38% land use statistic for agriculture, much of that land is also used for livestock cultivation, not just, not just crop cultivation. So, if we were to theoretically take only the crop production land currently being used, which is about 4 billion acres, replacing land-based cultivation by dropping these 30-story vertical farms side by side in theory, the food output would be enough to meet the nutritional needs to feed 34.4 trillion people. Given that we only need to feed about 9 billion by 2050, we only need to harness about two hundredths of a percent of this theoretical capacity, which it could be argued makes rather moot any seemingly practical objections common to the aforementioned extrapolation. In short, we have absolute global food abundance potential. Water. According to the World Health Organization, about 2.6 billion people, half of the developing world, lack proper sanitation, and about 1.1 billion people have no access to any type of clean drinking sources. Due to ongoing depletion, by 2025, it is estimated that almost 2 billion people will live in areas plagued by water scarcity, with two-thirds of the entire world population living in water-stressed areas. The cause? Obviously, waste and pollution. But I'm not going to talk about that, as it's the details and prevention, causes and prevention. That's not the point of this. Rather, let's take, a, again, a technological capacity approach only, considering modern purification and modern desalination systems on the macro-industrial scale. Purification. The average person today globally uses about 1,385 cubic meters of water per year. And this factors in all industrial activity as well such as agriculture. For the sake of argument, let's consider what it would take to purify all the fresh water, all of it, currently being used in the world on average annually. Given the global average of 1,385 cubic meters and a population of 7.2 billion, we arrive at a total annual use of about 10 trillion cubic meters. Using a New York State USA UV disinfection plant as a base measure which has an output capacity of roughly 3 billion cubic meters a year, taking up about 3.7 acres of land, we would need 3,327 plants to purify all the water used by the entire global population, taking up about 12,000 acres of land. Now, of course, needless to say, there are many other factors that come into play, such as power needs, location, and the like. That's fair enough. However, this is a minor inconvenience. 
12,000 acres is nothing compared to the 36 billion acres of land on the planet Earth. To give this a more practical example, the United States military alone has about 845,000 military bases or, and buildings, I should say, as well. This has been reported to take up about 30 million acres of land globally. Now, only four hundredths of a percent of that land would be needed to disinfect the total fresh water use of the entire world, if that were even needed, which of course it is not. Desalination. Now let's run the same theoretical extrapolation on desalination. The most common method of desalination used today is called reverse osmosis. And according to the International Desalination Association, it accounts for 60% of the installed capacity globally. Of course, you know, there are a lot of other methods that are emerging quite rapidly with high levels of efficiency you can move water much more quickly. But I'm not going to talk about that because I want to stay only within the common methods applied today. But keep in mind that everything I'm speaking of has dramatic improvements coming very soon. There is an advanced reversed osmosis seawater desalination plant in Australia that can produce about 150 million cubic meters of fresh water a year while occupying about 50 acres. Given the total annual water use of the world today is about 10 trillion cubic meters again, it would take about 60,000 plants to produce current global water usage in total. Using the dimensions of that plant, which is quite large, such a feat would take about 18,000 miles of coastland, or about 8.5% of the world's coastland. Now obviously that's not really ideal, that's a lot of coastland, but this exercise is about proportion. Clearly, we do not need to desalinate all water used once again, nor would we bypass the use of purification processes or ignore the vast reforms needed to preserve efficiency in fresh water. Or, or equally as important, the reuse schemes that are coming to fruition where buildings are able to use water in multiple ways by recycling water that comes from a sink into toilets and other mechanisms that unfortunately go unused for the vast majority. So let's do a slightly more practical real-life extrapolation, combining only purification and desalination with actual regional scarcity statistics. On the continent of Africa, roughly 345 million people lack access to fresh water. If we apply the noted global average consumption rate, again, of 1,385 cubic meters a year, seeking to provide each of those 345 million people that amount, we would need about 480 billion cubic meters produced annually. If we divided this number in half and used purification systems for one section and desalination for the other, the desalination process would need about 1.9% or 494 miles of coastline for desal desalination facilities. And only about 296 acres of land for purification facilities, which is a minuscule fraction of Africa's total land mass of about 7 billion acres. So this is highly doable even in this crude example. And obviously, in this case and in all cases, we would strategically maximize purification processes since it is clearly more efficient while using desalination for the remaining demand. In short, it's absurd for anyone on this planet to be going without fresh water. Not to mention, as an aside, 70% of all fresh water used today is used in agriculture and are grossly wasteful agricultural methods, 70%. If we, for example, apply, again, vertical farm systems, which have been noted to reduce water by upwards of 80% in comparison, uh, we would see an enormous freeing up of this unnecessarily scarce resource as well. Moving on to energy. We live in one massive perpetual motion machine known as the universe. The fact that we still use polluting fossil fuel stores in the earth or the incredibly unstable nuclear phenomenon, which gives very little room for human fallibility is truly frightening. There are four main large capacity, base load, as they would say, renewable energy means, which are currently most ideal as per our current state of technological application. These are ge geothermal plants, wind farms, solar fields, and water-based power. Due to time, I'm not going to explain what these mediums are, as I assume most know. I'm just going to run through the abundance comparison. Geothermal. 2006 MIT report on geothermal found that 13,000 zettajoules of power are currently available in the earth with the possibility of 2,000 zettajoules being harvestable with improved technology. 
The total energy consumption of all the countries on the planet is only about half a zettajoule a year. And this means literally thousands of years of planetary power could be harnessed in this medium alone. Geothermal energy also uses much less land than other energy sources. Over 30 years, a period of time commonly used to compare the life cycle impacts from different power sources, it was found that geothermal, a geothermal facility uses 404 meters squared of land per gigawatt hour, while a coal facility used 3,632 meters squared per gigawatt hour. If we were to do a basic comparison of geothermal to coal, given this ratio of meters squared to gigawatt hour, we find that we could fit about nine geothermal plants in the space of one coal plant. And that isn't accounting for the vast amount of land that is currently used for coal extraction. You know, those huge holes that we see in the earth. And by the way, the beauty of geothermal, and in fact, all of the renewables I'm gonna speak of, is that extraction or the harnessing location is almost always the exact same place as processing for the power distribution as well. All hydrocarbon sources, on the other hand, require both extraction and power production facilities almost always in separate locations, sometimes refineries as well in separate locations. In 2013, it was announced that a 1,000 megawatt power station was to begin construction in Ethiopia. We're going to use this as a base, theoretical for extrapolation. If a 1,000 megawatt geothermal power station operated at full capacity, 24 hours a day, 365 days a year, it would produce 8.7 million megawatt hours a year. The world's current annual energy usage is about 153 billion megawatt hours a year, which would mean it would take an abstraction about 17,000 geothermal plants to match global use. There are over 2,300 coal power plants in operation worldwide today. Using the aforementioned plant size capacity comparison of about nine geothermal plants fitting into one coal plant, the space of 1,940 coal plants would be needed, in theory, to contain the 17,000 geothermal plants, or 84% of the total in existence. Also, given that coal accounts for only 41% of today's current energy production, this theoretical extrapolation also shows how in 84% of the current space used by coal plants, geothermal could, apply, could supply 100% of total global power supply. Wind farms. It's been calculated that today, with existing turbine technology, which is improving rapidly, that Earth could produce hundreds of trillions of watts of power, uh, many more times than what the world consumes overall. However, breaking this down, using the 9,000-acre Alta Wind Center in California as a theoretical basis, which has, which has an active capacity of 1,320 megawatts of power, a theoretical annual output of 11 million megawatt hours is possible. This means 13,000 9,000 acre wind farms would be needed to meet total global demand of 153 billion megawatt hours. This requires about 119 million acres of land, or 0.3%, three tenths of a percent of the Earth's surface, to power the world in abstraction. However, as some may know, offshore wind is typically much more powerful than land based. According to the uh, assessment for, excuse me, of offshore wind energy resources for the United States, a report, 4,150 gigawatts of potential wind turbine technology, turbine capacity from offshore wind resources are available in the United States alone. Assuming this power capacity was consistent for a whole year, we end up with an energy conversion of 36 billion megawatt hours a year. Given the United States in 2010 used 25.7 billion megawatt hours, we find that offshore wind harvesting alone could exceed the national use by about 10.6 billion megawatt hours, or 41%. And axiomatically, extrapolating this national level of capacity to the rest of the world's coastlines, also taking into account the aforementioned land-based statistics, it is clear that we can power the world many, many times over with wind and quite practically. Solar fields. 
If humanity could capture one-tenth of one percent of the solar energy striking the Earth, we would have access to six times as much energy we consume in all forms today. The ability to harness this power depends on technology and how high the percentage of radiation conversion is. The Ivanpah Solar Electric System in California, it's a 3,500 acre field with an annual stated generation of about one million megawatt hours. If we were to extrapolate using this as, its theori as the theoretical basis, as we had before, it would take about 142,000 fields or about 500 million acres of land to theoretically meet current global energy use. That's about 1.5% of total land on Earth. Deserts cover about one-third of the world, or about 12 billion acres, and they tend to be fairly conducive to solar fields, while often less conducive to life support for people. Given the roughly 500 million acres theoretically needed to power the world as noted, only 4.1% of the world's deserts would be needed to contain these fields. Land that pretty much just otherwise sits there. Water-based power. There are five dominant types of water-based power. Wave, tidal, ocean current, osmotic, ocean thermal, and water course. Overall, the technology for harnessing ocean in general is in its infancy, but the potential is vast. And based on tradi traditional estimates, here is what the accepted global potentials have been estimated at. Using existing methods, we're not applying advanced technology that's not in application yet. This all figures up to be about 150,000 terawatt hours a year, or 96% of current global use of the half of a zettajoule. Pretty much enough power to power the world uh, in one medium alone, if applied. However, to give a sense of growing technological potential, because I think this is important, considering how, again, technology and, and water-oriented power is deeply in its infancy, recent developments in ocean current harnessing technology, the currents that go underneath the ocean, which can embrace much lower speeds now than they used to, it has been estimated that ocean current alone could now theoretically power the entire world if applied correctly. So let's recap. Wind, solar, water, and geothermal have shown as large-scale baseload renewable energy mediums that they are capable individually of meeting or vastly exceeding current annual global energy consumption at this time. And obviously a systems approach harmonizing an optimized fraction of each of those renewables strategically is the key to achieving a global total energy abundance. For example, it's not inconceivable to imagine a series of man-made floating islands off select coastlines which are designed to harness at once wind, solar, thermal difference, wave, tidal, and currents, all at the same time and in the same general area. Such energy islands would then pipe their harvest back to land for storage and distribution. It is only up to our design ingenuity to figure things like this out. Localization and reuse. The final energy factor I want to mention, which builds upon this systems thinking explicitly, has to do with localization and reuse schemes. Localized energy harnessing isn't given a fraction of the attention it needs today. Smaller scale renewable methods, which are conducive to single structures or small areas, find the same systems logic regarding combination. These local systems could also, if need be, connect back into the larger baseload systems, creating a total mixed medium integrated network, which happens sometimes today with solar. There are many localized systems out there which can draw energy from the immediate environment. Of course, there's solar power arrays, there's small wind harvesting systems, localized geothermal heating and cooling, and even architectural design just, that just simply makes natural light and heat cool preservation more efficient. Buckminster Fuller was great with his dome structures and how they actually contained energy quite well. Same idea. Extending outwards to city infrastructure, we see the same wasted possible efficiency almost everywhere. A simple technology called piezoelectric is able to convert pressure and mechanical energy directly into electricity. It's an excellent example of an energy reuse method with great potential. Existing applications have included power generation by people simply walking on these engineered floors and sidewalks, streets which can generate power as automobiles cross over them, and train rail systems which can also capture energy from passing train cars through pressure. 
It has been suggested by people that have studied this that a stretch of road less than one mile long, four lanes wide, a highway, and trafficked by about a thousand vehicles per hour can create about four tenths of a megawatt of power, which is enough to power 600 homes. Now extrapolate that out to the bulk of all the highways in the world. You have a very, very powerful regenerative energy source. Overall, if we think about the enormous mechanical energy wasted by vehicle transport modes and high traffic walking centers alone, the potential of that possible regenerated energy is quite substantial. And uh, it's this system's thinking once again that is needed in order to maintain sustainability while also pursuing this global energy abundance. And the final more complex subject, energy aside, will be the subject of material abundance and creating life supporting goods. Now, unlike the prior, more simple post-scarcity categories of food, water, and energy, the creation of a broad material abundance is, uh, of, excuse me, of all basic goods, which comprise the current average, you could say, of what is culturally considered a high standard of living today, is substantially more radical in its need for industrial revision and change. As expressed before, the current highly inefficient methods we use in industrial design, production, distribution, and regeneration is one of the main reasons we are in a constant state of global resource overshoot and destabilizing biodiversity loss. Also, as noted prior, there is no market incentive for advanced states of efficiency, as efficiency always reduces the amount of labor, resources, and service needed for a given purpose and hence reduces monetary circulation. I can't reinforce that enough. Therefore, a new synergistic systems view of industry focused explicitly on material and labor efficiency, along with an optimized strategy for sustainability of course is in order. For the sake of time, and as a lead into the final section on calculation, I'm gonna focus on a few principles or protocols and how each protocol assists efficiency towards this post-scarcity abundance. Otherwise, it would take an enormous amount of time. Uh, it's not as simple as the prior extrapolations. However, in this book that I mentioned, there will be a whole chapter dedicated to this, to this issue in great detail. Access, not property. A property-based society incentivizes the preference to own a given product rather than rent or gain access to as needed. I'm a filmmaker, and while I do rent some things occasionally, it's much more cost effective and smart to buy things because they have resale value. This incentive of universal ownership is incredibly wasteful when we examine actual use time of a given good. Facilitating a means of access where things can be literally shared will allow many more to gain use of goods they otherwise could not, along with there being less production of those goods in proportion. In a natural law resource-based economy, we seek to create an access abundance, not a property abundance, which is inherently wasteful. And as an aside, it's also important to note that property is not an empirical concept. Only access is empirically valid. Property is a prote protectionist contrivance. Access is the reality of the social and human condition. In order for you to truly say own a computer, you have to have had, alone, come up with the entire technological process that made that thing, along with the ideas that comprise the tools you might have used to make that computer. This is literally impossible and is what destroys the early labor theory of value property stuff that's put forward by classical economists. There's no such thing as property. There is only access and sharing, no matter what social system you employ. Designed in recycling. Contrary to our intuition, there is no such thing as waste in the natural world. Not only from the standpoint of the biosphere, which reuses everything in its process, the 92 main naturally occurring elements, a periodic table, that comprise all matter cannot be exhausted. Humanity has given very little consideration to the role of material regeneration and how all of our design practices must account for this recycling. In fact, as some may know, the highest state of this recycling will eventually come in the form of nanotechnology. Nanotechnology will eventually be able to create goods from the atomic level up and disassemble them right back down to the almost virtual starting point. 
It is the ultimate form of recycling. And by the way, I'm not suggesting this. I'm not suggesting that nanotechnology is even needed at this time, as though that that's what we're doing right now. It's just, this is a great principle to reference as far as re re regenerative uh, importance. Today, industry has little sense of synergy in this context. Recycling is an afterthought. Companies continue to do things such as blindly coat materials with chemical paints and the like that distort the properties of those materials, making the materials less salvageable or maybe completely unsalvageable to current recycling methods. It happens all the time. So long story short, strategic recycling just might be the most core seed of a continued abundance. Every landfill on earth is just a waste of potential. Number three, strategic confirmation of good design to the most conducive and abundant materials known. You will notice this efficiency qualification in what I just said, conducive and abundant. Conducive means most appropriate based on the material properties. Abundant means you weigh the value of conduciveness against the value of how accessible and low impact the material is compared to other materials, which may be more or less conducive. <laughs> this is a synergistic efficiency comparison. I'm sorry if the language sounded a little bit complicated. Probably the best example of this is home or domicile construction. The common use of wood, brick, screws, and the vast array of parts that is typical of a common house is comparatively vastly inefficient to more modern, simplified, prefabrication or moldable materials. A traditional 2,000 square foot home requires about 40 to 50 trees, about an acre. Compare that with houses that can be created in prefabrication processes with simple earth-friendly polymers, concrete, or other easily formable methods. 3D printing, for example, is on pace. These new approaches have a very small footprint as compared to our destructive, excuse me, as compared to our destruction of global forests, which continue for wood. Home construction today is one of the most resource intensive and wasteful industrial mediums in the world, with about 40% of all materials collected for construction ended up as waste in the end. Number four, design conduciveness for labor automation. Now this is, a, this is very foreign to many. The more we conform to the current state of rapid, efficient production processes, obviously the more abundance we can create. If you read texts on manufacturing processes, they typically divide labor into three categories. There's human assembly, there's mechanization, and there's automation. Human assembly means handmade, mechanization means machines assist the laborer, and automation means no human action. Imagine if you needed a chair, and there were three designs. The first is elaborate and complex, and could only be done by hand. The second is more streamlined, where its parts can be made mostly by machines, but would need to be assembled by hand. The third is a chair, is produced by one, the third chair, excuse me, is produced by one process, fully automated. The latter chair design would be the design goal, in theory, of this new approach. What this would do is reduce the complexity of the automation process with little to no human labor. Imagine a production plant that not only produces cars, it can produce virtually any kind of industrial product comprised of the same basic shared materials. This is very feasible. This would increase output substantially. In other words, we are optimizing the means of production. And as an aside, many who see stuff like this, they think that this means there's not gonna be any variety in the future, that it's just gonna be cold and uniform and everyone gets the same thing. No, I'm just using this as an example to make an efficiency point. Being conducive to automation does not mean universal uniformity of design because the incredible amount of variance possible in our current automation technology is amazing and accelerating. Modular robotics, there's many different self-changing machines that can create a great amount of variance. All this means is the existing processes in their current state should be respected to ease production. So please don't confuse this with the idea that everyone just gets the same everything. What they get is the same basic sustainability principles, which come in many different forms, if you can understand that. So these four parameters set in motion, along with the basic intent to assist the trend of ephemeralization on all levels. There is little, little doubt that every human being could have a very high standard of living. It is simply about converting 
all of the inefficiency we have straight into productivity strategically. I will conclude this section by noting that R. Buckminster Fuller is probably the only human being that has ever attempted to account and quantify the state of resources and their potential uh, within the past 100 years. And while primitive, he was able to arrive at the following conclusion in 1969. Man developed such intense mechanization in World War I that the percentage of total world population that were industrial haves rose by 1919 to the figure of 6%. This was an abrupt change in history. By the time of World War II, 20% of all humanity had become industrial haves. At the present moment, the proportion of haves is at 40% of humanity. If we up the performances of resources from the present level to a highly feasible overall efficiency of 12% more, increasing by 12% our use holistically, on average, all humanity can be provided for. The exponential increase in information technology since 1969, along with the applied technology and advanced synergetic understandings we have today, I suspect now far exceeds uh, we are way beyond the 12% efficiency increase that he saw as needed. The problem now, in part, is conforming to industrial conduciveness appropriately, which is currently not done. And this leads us to part three, economic organization and calculation. Now, if you're wondering why I spent so much time on the prior points of post-scarcity and those two core problems inherent to market capitalism, social imbalance and environmental imbalance, it's because you cannot understand the logic of the economic factors involved in this model without those prior awarenesses. A natural law resource-based economy is not just a progressive outgrowth of our increased capacity to be productive as a species, as though we would just gradually evolve out of the market system step by step into this approach. No, the dire need for this system's removal needs to be realized once again. It has to become a part, in fact, of the incentive structure of the new model. The historical understanding that if we do not adjust in this way, we will revert right back into this highly unstable period we are in right now. An economic model is a theoretical construct representing component processes by a set of variables or functions describing the logical relationships between them. Basic definition. If anyone has studied traditional or market-based economic modeling, a great deal of time is often spent on things such as price trends, behavioral patterns, utilitarianistic functions, inflation, currency fluctuations, and so forth. Rarely, if ever, is anything said about public or ecological health. Why? Because the market is, again, life-blind and decoupled from the science of life support and sustainability. It is simply a proxy system. The best way to think about this economy is not in the traditional terms, but rather as an advanced production, distribution, and management system, which is democratically engaged by the public through a kind of participatory economics that facilitates input processes, such as design proposals and demand assessment, while filtering all actions through what we, through what we will call sustainability and efficiency protocols. These are the basic rules of industrial action set by natural law, not human opinion. As noted prior, neither of these interests are structurally inherent in the capitalist model. And it is clear that humanity needs a model that has this type of stuff built right into it for consideration. Structural system goals. All economic systems have structural goals, which may not be readily apparent. Market capitalism's structural goal, as described, is growth and maintaining rates of consumption high enough to keep people employed at any given time. And employment requires also a culture of real or perceived inefficiency. And that essentially means the preservation of scarcity in one form or another. That is its structural goal. And good luck getting a market economist to admit to that. This model goal is to optimize technical efficiency and create the highest level of abundance we possibly can within the bounds of earthly sustainability, seeking to meet human needs directly. System overview. 
One of the great myths of this model is that it is centrally planned. I'm sure many of us have heard this. What this means based on historical precedent is that it is assumed that an elite group of people basically will make the economic decisions for a society. No, this model is a collaborative design system, CDS, not centrally planned. It is based entirely upon public interaction facilitated by programmed open source systems that enable a constant dynamic feedback flow that can literally allow the input of the public on any given industrial matter, whether personal or social. Now a common question when you bring that up, they say, well, who programs this system? The answer is everyone and no one. The tangible rules of the laws of nature as they apply to environmental sustainability and engineering efficiency is a completely objective frame of reference. The nuances may change to some degree over time, but the general principles remain. Over time, the logic of such an approach will also become more rigid because we learn more as we perfect our understandings, and hence less room for subjectivity in certain areas that might have had it prior. Again, I'll be describing this more so in a moment. Also, the programs themselves will be available in an open source platform, platform for public input and review. Absolutely transparent. And if someone noticed a problem or unapplied optimization strategy, which would probably be the case, it is evaluated and tested by the community. Kind of like a Wikipedia for calculation, except much less subjective than Wikipedia without the moody administrators. Another traditional confusion surrounds a concept, concept which has become, to many, the defining difference between capitalism and everything else. And it has to do with whether the means of production is privately owned or not. And this is replete throughout tons of uh, traditional uh, literary treatments on capitalism when they describe how it's the ultimate manifestation of human behavior as a society. If you don't know what this means, the means of production refers to the non-human assets that create goods, such as machines, tools, factories, offices, and the like. In capitalism, the means of production is owned by the capitalist, by historical definition, hence the origin of the term. I bring this up because there has been an ongoing argument for a century that any system which does not have its means of production owned as a form of private property is just not going to be as economically efficient as one that has, or maybe not even efficient at all. This, as the argument goes, is because of the need for price, the price mechanism. Price, which has a fluid ability to exchange value amongst virtually any type of good due to its indivisibility of value, creates indeed a feedback mechanism that connects the entire market system in a certain narrow way. Price is a way to allocate scarce resources amongst competing interests, for sure. Price, property, and money translate in short, subjective demand preferences into semi-objective exchange values. I say semi because it is, again, a relative, culturally relative measure only. Absent most every factor that gives true technical consideration to a given material or good. In other words, it has nothing to do with what the materials or goods are. It's just a mechanism. Perhaps the only real technical data, in fact, I would say, that price embraces very crudely relates to resource scarcity and labor energy, resource scarcity and labor energy. You can basically find that in price. So in this context, the question becomes, moving on, is it possible to create a system that can equally, if not more efficiently, facilitate feedback with respect to consumer preference, demand, labor value, and resource or component scarcity without the price system, subjective property values, or exchange? And of course there is. The trick is to completely eliminate exchange and create a direct control and feedback link between the consumer and the means of production itself. The consumer becomes part of the means of production and the industrial complex, if you will, becomes nothing more than a tool that is accessed by the public to generate goods. In fact, as alluded to prior, the same system can be used for just about any societal calculation virtually eliminating the state government, in fact, and politics as we know it. It is a participatory decision-making process. And as an aside, as far as the fact that there will indeed always be scarcity of something in the world, 
which is the very basis of existence of price, market, and money, human beings can, again, either understand the dire need to exist in a steady state relationship with nature and the global human species for cultural and environmental sustainability or not. We can either continue down the same path we are now or become and become more aware or responsible to the world and to each other, seeking post-scarcity and using natural law rules of sustainability and efficiency to decide how to best allocate our, our raw materials or not. But I think the former is the most intelligent path. I say that because, again, this resource argument always comes down to the abstractions of resources. It never, excuse me, the abstraction of scarcity. It never qual qualifies what scarcity is in certain contexts. It doesn't separate scarcity, and that's its fatal flaw between human needs and human wants. Also, I want to point out another fallacy, which is this, which of this private ownership of the means production, a fallacy of this broad concept is its culture lag. Today, we are seeing a merger of capital goods, consumer goods, and labor power. Machines are taking over human labor power, becoming capital goods, while also reducing in size to become consumer goods. I'm sure most everyone in this room has a home paper printer. When you send a file to print from your computer, you are in control of a mini version of a means of production. What about 3D printers? In some cities today, there are now 3D printing labs, which people can send their design and print, designed to print in physical form. The model I'm going to describe is a similar idea. The next step is the creation of a strategically automated industrial complex, localized as much as possible, which is designed to produce, through automated means, the average of everything any given region has found demand for. Think about it. On-demand production on a mass scale. Consider for a moment how much storage space, transport energy, and overrun waste is immediately eliminated by this approach. I think the days of large, wasteful, mass-producing economies of scale are coming to an end. Well, if we want them to. This type of thinking, true economic calculation, by the most technical sense of the term, I can't reiterate that enough, we are calculating to be as technically efficient and conservative as possible, which again, almost paradoxically, is what will facilitate a global access abundance to meet all human needs and beyond. Structure and processes, moving on. So I'm going to walk through the following three processes. The collaborative design interface and industrial schematic, resource management, feedback and value, and general principles of sustainability and the macro calculation. The collaborative design interface is essentially the new market. It's a market of ideas. This system is the first step in any production interest. It can be engaged by a single person. It can be engaged by a team. If you have friends and you want to put it together, it's sort of like how businesses think. It can be engaged by everyone. It is open source and open access. And your concept is open to input from anyone interested in that good genre or anyone that's online that cares to contribute. Obviously, it comes in the form of a website, as I stated. And likewise, whatever exists as a final decision, whatever is put into production, even though in theory everything will be under modification at all times, but what has been approved, if you will, is digitally stored in a database which makes that good available to everyone, sort of like a goods catalog, except it contains all of the, all of the information digitally that is required to produce it. This is how demand is assessed. It's feedback and it's immediate. Instead, of course, of advertising and the unidirectional consumer good proposal system, which it is, that we have today where corporations basically tell you what you should buy, with the public generally going with the flow, favoring one good component or feature, using price, of course, if they don't like something, then clearly they won't produce it anymore to weed out supply and demand. This system works the opposite way. The entire community has the option of presenting ideas for everyone to see and weigh in on and build upon. And whatever isn't in, of interest simply won't be executed to begin with. There's no testing here, such as you would see with marketing, which is incredibly wasteful. It's as simple as that. The actual mechanism of proposal will come in the form of an interactive design interface, such as we see with computer-aided design, or CAD as it's called, or more specifically, computer-aided engineering, which is a more complicated uh, synergistic process. 
And as an aside, uh, you know, some C computer-aided design programs as they exist is having an enormous learning curve, and of course they do. But just as the first computers were very difficult code-based interfaces, which were later replaced by small little programs in the form of graphic icons that we're all so familiar with, the future CAD-type programs can be oriented in the exact same way to make them more user-friendly. And obviously, not everyone has to engage in design. Some people, like most people today, they, they appreciate what's been created prior. They, they absorb and they use what other people have come up with. So there's a diminishing law of returns in a lot of ways, if you will. Not everyone has to get in there and that's, you know, you have some role to do this. But many will, and many will enjoy the process. And of course, you can customize things as you go, which is a great, a great point. I mean, there's minor things that can happen with a product that someone doesn't know anything about, but maybe they just want to change the color and that's it. Obviously, that doesn't take a lot of education. More importantly, uh, technically speaking, the beauty of these design and engineering programs today is that they incorporate advanced physics and other real-world natural law properties. So a good isn't just viewable in a static 3D model. It can be tested right there, digitally. And while some testing capacity might be limited today, it's simply a matter of focus to perfect such digital, digital means. For example, in the automotive industry, long before new ideas are built, they run them through similar digital testing processes. And there is no reason to believe that we will not eventually be able to digitally represent and imitate and set in motion virtually all known laws of nature and time and being able to apply them to different contexts. Similarly, and this is critical, this design that's proposed to this system is filtered through a series of sustainability and efficiency protocols which relate to not only the state of the natural world, but also the total industrial system in as far as what is compatible. Processes of evaluation and suggestion would include the following. Strategically maximize durability, adaptability, standardization of genre components, strategically integrated recycling conduciveness, as I mentioned before, and strategically conducive designs themselves, making them conducive for labor automation. I'm going to go through these each quickly. Durability just means to make the good as strong and as long-lasting as relevant. Uh, the materials utilized, comparatively assuming possible substitutions due to levels of scarcity or other factors, would be dynamically calculated, likely automatically, in fact, by the design system to be most conducive to an optimized durability standard. Adaptability. This means that the highest state of flexibility for replacing component parts is made. Have anyone seen this thing called phone blocks? Where they're, yeah, brilliant. In the event a component part of this good becomes defective or out of date of any good, whenever possible, the design facilitates that such components are easily replaced to maximize full product lifespan. Standardization, standardization of genre components. All new designs either conform to or replace, if they're updated, existing components which are either already in existence or outdated due to a comparative lack of efficiency. Many don't know this, but a man named Eli Whitney in 1801 uh, was the first to really apply standardization in production. He made muskets, and back then they were handmade, and you, they were uninterchangeable. So the musket parts, if, if anything broke, you couldn't take apart from something else. He was the first to actually make the tools to do this, and he basically started the entire process of standardization, and, and the uh, U.S. military was now able to buy huge things of muskets and interchange them, and, and much more sustainable even though they're killing people. <laughs> Which is interesting for the military, because if you think about it, the military uh, is one of the most efficient systems on the planet, because it's absent the market economy. This thing is, if you really want to look to where, where industrial efficiency was born, I, as much as I dislike it, the military is, is where, it's, where it becomes, uh, it's where it's been harnessed the most, excuse me. So anyway, this logic not only applies to a given product, it's applied to a, the entire good genre, standardization. And by the way, uh, this efficiency will never happen in a market economy with its basis in competition as proprietary technology removes all such collaborative efficiency. No one wants that. No one wants to share everything like that. Otherwise, people wouldn't have a need to go back to their, their company of the root company and buy the part. They would go somewhere else or they'd have access to it, in other, other means. Recycling conduciveness. 
As noted before, this means every design must conform to the current state of regenerative possibility. The breakdown of any good must be anticipated and allowed for in the most optimized way and made conducive for labor automation. This means that the current state of optimized automated production is directly taken into account, seeking to refine the process, excuse me, seeking to refine the design that's submitted to be most conducive to the current state of production with the least amount of human labor or monitoring. Again, we seek to simplify the way materials and production means are used so that the maximum number of goods can be produced with the least variation of materials and production equipment. It's a very important point. And these five factors are what we could call in total the optimized design efficiency function, if you want to be technical. Uh, keep this in mind as I'm going to return to all this in a moment. Moving on to the industrial complex, the layout. This means the network of facilities which are directly connected to the design and database system I've just described. Servers, production, distribution, recycling is basically it. Also, we need to relate the current state of resources, critically important, as per the Global Resource Management Network, another tier, which I'm going to also describe in a moment. Production. This means, of course, actual manufacturing would evolve, as expressed before, as automated factories with increasingly, which, excuse me, are increasingly able to produce more with less material input, inputs and less machines ephemeralization. And if we are to consciously design out unnecessary levels of complexity, we can further this efficiency trend greatly with an ever lower environmental impact and resource use while maximizing, again, our abundance producing potential. The number of production facilities, whether homogeneous or heterogeneous as they would be, be called, would be strategically distributed topographically based around population statistics. Very simple stuff. It's no different than how grocery stores work today, where they try to average distances as best they can uh, between pockets of people and neighborhoods. You could call this the proximity strategy, which I'll mention again in a moment. Distribution. This can either be directly from the production facility as in the case of an on-demand, custom, one-off production, or it can be sent to a distribution library for public act access in mass based on demand interest in that region. Uh, the library system is where goods can be, be obtained. Some goods can be conducive to low demand custom production, and some will not be. Uh, food is the easy example of a mass production necessity, while a personally tailored piece of furniture would come directly from the manufacturing facility once created. And I suspect, again, this on-demand process, uh, which will likely become equally as utilized as mass production, uh, will be an enormous advantage. Uh, as noted, on-demand production is more efficient since the resources are going to be utilized for the exact use demand as opposed to the block things that we do today. Distribution, excuse me, I should say in the context of the distribution library, which is a specific point. Inventory is assessed in a dynamic direct feedback link, of course, between production, distribution, and demand. If that doesn't make sense to you, again, all you have to think about is how inventory accounting and tracking works at any major commercial distribution center today, with, of course, a few adjustments made in this model. We're already doing this type of stuff already. And regardless of where the good is classified to go, whether it's custom or not, libraries or to the direct user, this is still an access system. In other words, at any time, the user of the custom good can return the item for reprocessing, just as a person who obtains something from the library, library can as well. Since, as noted, the good has been pre-optimized, all goods are pre-optimized for conducive recycling, odds are the recycling facility is actually built directly in to the production facility or the genre production facility, depending on how many facilities you need to create the variety of demand. So again, there's no trash here. Whether it's a phone, a couch, a computer, a jacket, a book, Everything goes back to where it came from for direct reprocessing. Ideally, this is a zero waste economy. Resource management feedback and value. The computer aided and engineering design process obviously does not exist in a vacuum. Processing demands input from the natural resources that we have. So connected to this design process, literally built into the optimized design efficiency function noted prior 
is dynamic feedback from an Earth-wide accounting system which gives data about all relevant resources which pertain to all productions. Today, most major industries keep periodic data of, of their genre materials as far as how much they have, but clearly it's difficult to ascertain uh, due to the nature of corporate secrets and the like. But it's still done, and regardless to whatever degree necessary this is possible, excuse me, whatever degree technically possible this is, all resources are tracked and monitored in as close to real time ideally as possible. Why? Mainly because we need to maintain equilibrium with the Earth's regenerative processes at all times, while also, as noted before, work to strategically maximize our use of the most abundant materials while minimizing anything with emerging scarcity. Value. As far as value, the two dominant measures which will undergo constant dynamic recalculation through feedback as industry unfolds is scarcity and labor complexity. Scarcity value without a market system could be assigned a numerical value, say 1 to 100. 1 would denote the most severe scarcity with respect to current rate of use, and 100 the least severe. 50 would mark the steady state dividing line. For example, if the use of wood lumber passes below the steady state level of 50, which would mean consumption is currently surpassing the Earth's natural regeneration rate, this would trigger a counter move of some kind. So, such as, excuse me, the process of material substitution, hence the replacement for wood in any given future productions of finding alternatives. And of course, if you're a free market mindset listening to this, you're likely going to object at this point by saying, without price, how can you compare value of one material to another or many materials? Simple. You organize genre, genres, excuse me, or groups of similar use materials and quantify as best you can their related properties and degree of efficiency for a given purpose. And then you apply a general numerical value spectrum to those relationships as well. For example, there are a spectrum of metals which have different efficiencies for electrical conductivity. These efficiencies can be quantified. And if they can be quantified, they can be compared. So if copper goes below the 50 median uh, value regarding its scarcity, calculations are triggered by the management program to compare the state of other conducive materials in its database, compare their scarcity level and their efficiency, preparing for substitution. And that kind of information goes right back to the designer. And naturally, this type of reasoning might indeed get extremely complicated as again, uh, just numerous resources and numerous efficiencies and purposes, which is exactly why it's calculated by a machine, not people. And it's also why it completely blows the price system out of the water when it comes to true resource awareness and intelligent management. Labor complexity. This simply means estimating the complexity of a given production. Complexity in the context of an automated oriented industry can be quantified by defining and comparing the number of process stages, if you will. Any given good production can be foreshadowed as to how many of these stages of production it will take. It can then be compared to other good productions, ideally in the same genre, for a quantifiable assessment. The units of measurement are the stages, in other words. For example, a chair that can be molded in three minutes from simple polymers in one process will have a lower labor complexity value than a chair which requires automated assembly down a more tedious production chain with mixed materials. In the event a given process value is too complex or inefficient in terms of what is currently possible in production, or too inefficient by comparison to an already existing design of a similar nature as well, the design, along with other parameters, would be flagged and would be re-evaluated. And again, all of this comes from feedback from the design interface, and there's no reason to assume that with ongoing advancement in AI, artificial intelligence, wouldn't be able to feedback not only the highlight of the problem, but it would also create suggestions or substitutions for you to understand in the interface. Microcalculation. Okay, let's put some of this reasoning together, and I hope everyone can bear with me. If we were to look at good design, in the broadest possible way with respect to industrial unfolding, we would end up with about four functions or processes, each relating to the four dominant linear stages of design, production, distribution, and recycling. The following proposition should be obvious enough as a rule structure. 
All product designs must adapt to optimize design efficiency. They must all adapt to optimize production efficiency, and they must adapt to optimize distribution efficiency, and they must adapt to optimize recycling efficiency. Seems redundant, but this is how we have to think about it. Here is a linear block schematic as shown before, and the symbolic logic representation, which embodies the sub-processes or functions I'm now going to very generally break down. Process one, the design. Optimize design efficiency. A product design must meet or adapt to criteria set by what we have called the current efficiency standards. This efficiency process has five evaluative sub-processes, as noted before earlier in the presentation. Durability, adaptability, standardization, recycling conduciveness, maximized automation conduciveness. Further breakdown of these variables and logical associations can figuratively be made as well, of course, which I don't think is conducive for this type of presentation because we're going to get, get lost in ever-reductionist minutia. But for more detail, this stuff will be developed much more and be put into this text as I've just described, which will be available for free. I'm going to try and do my best to give a general efficiency process here. So in the end, when it comes to this design efficiency process set, we end up with this design function at the top. And I'll list the, just to see it, I'll list all of the uh, function meanings at the end. We move on to process two, production efficiency. In short, this is the digital filter that moves design to one of two production facility types. One for high demand or mass goods and one for low demand or custom goods. The first uses fixed automation meaning unvaried production ideal for high demand, and the second, flexible automation, which can do a variety of things, but usually in shorter runs. This is a distinction that's commonly made in traditional manufacturing terms. This structure assumes only two types of facilities, of course. Obviously, there could be more based on the production factors. But if the design rules in the process are respected, as expressed before, there shouldn't be much variety. And over time, things get simpler and simpler. So to state this, I'm just going to run through it for those that like to hear things spelled out like this. All product designs are filtered by a demand class determination process D. The de demand class determination process filters based on the standard set for low demand or high demand. All low consumer demand product designs are to be manufactured by the flexible automation process. All high consumer demand product designs are manufactured by the fixed automation process. Also, both the manufacturing of low consumer demand and high consumer demand product designs will be regionally allocated as per the proximity strategy of the manufacturing facility. This simply means you keep things as close to you as possible, as close to the average of any given demand as far as what type of facility you're using. And this will change over time as populations change. So you keep updating. Process three. Once process two is finished, the product design is now a product and it moves towards optimized distribution efficiency. In short, all products are allocated based on the prior demand class determination as noted before. So low consumer demand products follow a direct distribution process. High consumer demands follow the mass distribution process, which would likely be the libraries in that case. Both, of course, low consumer demand and high, high consumer demand products will be regionally allocated per the proximity strategy, as noted before. And process four, very simple. The product undergoes its lifespan. Ideally, it's been updated and adapted. Ideally, it's been used to the highest degree and made as advanced as it could within its life cycle. And once it's done, it becomes void and moves on to process four, which is simply optimized recycling efficiency. All voided products will follow a regenerative protocol, which is a sub-process that clearly I'm not going to go into because it's deeply complicated and is the role of engineers to develop over time. And this is just a you know, simple macro representation since, again, these sub-variables or sub-processes uh, go on to quite a large degree. So, Keeping all of this in mind, again, a lot of this will be in the text, and hopefully others, I think, can see this stuff that are fluent with this type of thinking and hone in and perfect these equations and relationships. Um, what I've tried to do here is give a broad sense of how this type of thing unfolds. As a concluding statement, more or less, the way this extrapolation of sustainability and efficiency, it's really quite a simple logical thing. It's not to be a rocket science to see how things work in this level. So creating a real program 
that can factor in what are hundreds if not thousands of sub-processes in algorithmic form as they pertain to such an economic complex is indeed a massive project in and of itself, but it's more of a tedious project. You don't need to be a genius to figure this stuff out. And I think this is an excellent think tank, think tank program for anyone out there that's interested in projects. I have a number of little projects that I'm trying to get going when I have time. One is something called the Global Redesign Institute, which is a macroeconomic approach to redesign the entire surface of the planet, basically. And then this other programming concept, we create an open source platform where people can begin to engineer this very program that I'm describing. And that's it. I was going to make a conclusion to this talk, but it was already way too long. <laughs> So uh, I just hope this gives a deeper understanding of the model, how it could work, and thank you for listening. Say to somebody that would uh, say, ah, economies of scale, this is powerful, this is a, an efficient, uh, this is a driving motor of productivity in this world, uh, to have the same factory producing cars and share doesn't, and cars and chairs doesn't work out. You need these economies of scale. Um, what would you say? Uh, even uh, mass production in socialist economies are still of scale. They have enormously large factories mass producing things at will. All I'm saying is that economies of scale due to ephemeralization to the fact that the means of production, machines like 3D printing, are getting more advanced, smaller and smaller to the effect where you might in the future have a very large printer that can produce maybe all the clothes that you would need in your home, would produce a lot of the general home goods. The tendency is everything's getting smaller and customizable very easily without the need for mass production. So without the overrun problem of mass production, you could very easily have a society where everything's on demand, everything where you, if you want to produce like mass production, you can. If you want to produce one of something, customize a vehicle for your purposes, the technology is there to facilitate that without the necessity. It doesn't mean that there's less made. It doesn't mean demand isn't being met. It just means there isn't the necessity for these huge fixed automation machines to run the same processes over and over again. Does that make sense? Thank you. Um, as I have many, many questions, I'll just state one of them. Um, I'm an engineer, and as an engineer, I know that uh, in order to have a stable system, you need to have a negative feedback, something that which counteracts and stabilizes the system. So uh, this negative feedback would reinforce uh, social behavior and then would uh, punish somehow uh, Anti-social behavior. What is the negative feedback of the system you propose? Well, if we're if we're talking about material production, the negative feedback is well. I would say the negative issues that are are possible or conducive to any given production are immediately addressed in that equation. I called the I called the uh, design efficiency equation, which means that you have a rule set which the entire point of this rule set is to bypass as many possible foreshadowable problems you will ever have. Now on a larger level, uh, excuse me, I'll also point out that the global resource management idea, where you have these things that are monitoring scarcity, for example, it's all in real time. So it's both positive and negative feedback, if you, if you will, generally speaking. So the point is to anticipate. It's, as Buckmaster Fuller would say, it's anticipatory design. And I think all of that stuff is equated. And clearly, you're monitoring the possible negative effects of everything, to be more specific. Uh, that just goes with the nature of any kind of a sustainable approach. And it would be built right into the program. And again, initially started right in that, in that initial des design efficiency algorithm that I spoke of, which makes sure at the very front, at the very beginning, that nothing is done that isn't meeting sustainability standards. So the punishment, if you will, is the fact that if you submit something that isn't sustainable and you, can't, you don't conform to the system, you can't do it. It's not gonna let you do it because it doesn't meet protocols of sustainability or efficiency. I hope that answered your question. TZM Belgium asked, do you envision a sort of structure within TZM to review TZM defined and give constructive feedback in a structured manner in this way improving, evolving TZM defined? As far as the textbook, sure. Uh, there has to be some starting point. There will be numerous editions of this text. We need something in motion now. This movement has been without a, without a firm text for a couple of years now and it's taken a long time to put it together. 
The movement is, has been compiled and amalgamated and filtered through these, the, the core TZM lecture team, if you will, which is a very small group at this point, which I hope will get larger. Having an open source communicative platform for this type of material, all, it, it's very helpful, but it can also create enormous time length of actual finishing. So let's get this out first, and then all that stuff will be reviewable. A, a wiki could be set up to post and review, and people can give feedback. I'd love to see that. But we, something has to be set in motion to set the standard first. So let's get this out first, and then there will be larger order review. And that's the whole point. I mean, everything that's in this text is based on feedback. That's had been happening throughout the years. It's not just novel stuff that's been put together without feedback. All right, I have a question not exactly related to the lecture, but I would like to you to give uh, your opinion on the uh, differences and similarities between the Zeitgeist movement and anarchism as a, as a movement, as an ideology. You mean, uh, well, there's a number of different schools of anarchism. You mean, are you, you mean communist anarchist? You mean capitalist anarchist? You mean anarchist anarchist? <laughs> The anarchist anarchist, let's say. I have no idea what the anarchist anarchist actually is. I'm saying, I, I want to know what you're saying. Though. Please describe to me what, what, you're, what, you're, what you're talking about so I know. How many of these uh, core, let's say, ideologies of anarchism which are connected with uh, basically... The, I, don't know how, I don't know how to explain it right now because uh, it would take too much time. Basically... Anarchism is in this core meaning of, the, of uh, rule, uh, no rule, and uh, the society without any uh, form of uh, oppression or, or rule or sure. um, hi hierarchical structure. I can relate to that. I think in the context of a capitalist anarchist, which I'm familiar with, they look at any act of what they call coercion, so anybody imposing their will on somebody else as morally unjustifiable, and they present lots of arguments for that. I, I think all of those things that are trying to stop oppression of society are all well and good, but if you look at the framework of the synergy of our relationship to each other on this planet in the environment that we're in, the pressures that are created, you cannot reduce coercion to just behavioral action. It's actually a process. You know, when someone mugs you on the street and takes your money, that's an act of coercion, obviously. But yet, you don't know what happened to that person in their life to deprive them to such a degree where they are forced to do that. That might not have been what they wanted to do at all. There was a story that happened in New York. The, a mugger went in and uh, was right down the street from me, and he stole some food, actually just robbed uh, the cashier. And then a year later, he went back and paid the cashier back and apologized and explained uh, why he did what he had to do because of pressures in his family. So... A lot of that stuff flies out the window with me when you think about non-coercion as a universal principle because it only thinks about behavioral or policy stuff, you know, taxation or, or tariffs if you want to talk about economic coercion. I think it all falls flat. If you have, I would say this proportion is what is caused by the coercive negativity caused by human behavior alone, if you will, if there's even such a thing, and this is the coercion that is a consequence of our inefficient system. And not to mention, as a final point, nature is inherently coercive. <laughs> we can't just do anything we want. I can't run up this wall and run on the ceiling. Uh, I just can't do that. So there's a, there are laws that restrict our behavior, hence the sustainability and efficiency laws. So rather than think about people imposing upon you, which I think is where anarchism kind of is rooted, Let's remember that people are, their behavior is a consequence of influence and also remember that we have to be sustainable and efficient, therefore we have to follow some set of rules. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, is this working? Okay. Okay. In a system based on access, it is possible, it would be possible that someone takes very much, much more than he needs. Mm -hmm. So do you think there would be the necessity to, to define a maximum of that someone takes, or how could that be possible? I think the, in the case of severe, there's no incentive to do it, first of all, which I point out, because that's a common question. Why would someone go into a facility and take 40 televisions? What are they going to do? They can't resell them. Maybe they have an art piece. <laughs> and that, that can be provided for in a certain sense. I think the equation would be, if, someone, if everyone was to take the same amount, would it work out? And there would be some type of buffer. 
and it would say, you know, this process, and you can take X amount, but if you took more, it would mean that everyone else would have to take, if, if everyone else took the same amount, then it would be an overrun. So it's a sustainability equation, a sustainability of balance based on population. Does that make sense? A very rude, excuse me, a very crude equation that says, if not everyone can have the same number of what you're having, then, then you're in overrun and you're out of sustainable line. Now, I think that would be a limited problem because there's no reason to hoard things. And I think the only example would be, you know, very extreme examples uh, where someone needs something for a very abstract concept. Uh, and there could be other processes of engagement when it comes to industry as far as how that could be obtained. If someone wanted to maintain, get that many, they wouldn't go to a library to do it. They would order it in advance and go through the sustainability protocols put forward through the machine, the mechanism, excuse me, the process that I talked about. It would be a separate layer of engagement. It wouldn't just be taking a bunch of stuff from one facility. So I don't know why the reward would be for that. I mean, I, I, excuse me, I don't think the incentive would exist for that. And again, you could create alerts, if you will, in, in the event someone did that. And again, the whole foundation here when it comes to this idea of luxury, this idea of what it means to be in line with, with sustainability isn't just a natural equation, it's a resource distribution equa equation for the whole world. If a given resource that's very dire comes into play, we can either fight for it, just like we do today, or we can understand it. And that means that others would have to have less of that resource. That way we maintain social stability. If you have an educational system that's aware of that, say, well, you know, we don't, we're running out of this. We, can't, we don't have substitutions. We have to do something very different in process. Then everyone would understand, if they're educated, to understand that if they, excuse me, that they didn't do that, social instability would arise. It's a, very, it's a hard point to make because people aren't used to thinking that way because we're so individualistic. But I think about my actions in terms of how it affects everything. And if we have an educational system that thinks the same way, I don't think uh, those problems would arise, and I think there'd be an easy way to circ circumvent uh, rare issues of that consideration. Does that make sense? That's, I'm glad you brought that up, though, because I thought about that, and I was actually going to include that very point in the presentation based on what's, what I said in a much more organized way than what I'm saying right now, uh, because it is a good point. It's a very good point. Yep. All right. Uh, we have a question from the internet. Louise from Finland uh, is asking, how does the system proposed uh, deal with psychopaths and other mentally ill people or people who do not plan to play nice, so to speak, whatever the reason for the behavior? Sure. Uh, mental illness, of course, exists, and there are people that very much do not have control of their actions. And if you study mental illness, it's an issue of public health. It's not a behavioral issue. So in the future, you know, there's often talk. People say, well, there's no police. There's no this and that there's clearly going to be some type of subculture that deals with problems like this for the sake of stability in a society. Just like if somebody in a very small town uh, goes completely mad, the entire public is going to do what they can to make sure they don't cause much damage or hurt anybody. So do you need a, a force to take care of that? Maybe. But they would be a health force. They would be a public health type of institution that sees the damage done and they contain the person and they figure out what's happening. And if it's the worst case scenario and they're unredeemable, they're literally, they're, their brain is degraded to that degree where they're a danger to themselves and others, then you have to have containment. You don't punish them, you don't do the prison system thing where you're literally just mean to people. You just, you just take them aside and you do what you can. You learn about it too. You learn about the causality because almost all mental illness, there are genetic predispositions, but even schizophrenia has a 50 50%. 50 you pretty much, if you have a schizophrenic gene, there's a 50% chance you're gonna get it. What causes it to go over the edge? Stress. So if you have a highly stressful society, and that's the cause of most mental illness today anyway, overburden of stress and mental angst and pressures that emerge unnecessarily, usually due to scarcity and familial relations in the midst of scarcity and all the things that the market system creates. So that's your focus of prevention. And then again, if you have to contain somebody, well, that's, that's just like containing somebody that has a really bad flu you know, that could kill other people if they can't get it under control. Hey. Hey, Peter. Um, nice post-scarcity exercise, by the way. It was Thanks. Really, it was really good. I appreciate that. I was uh, working so I that. Just, yeah, I wanted to talk more on, on about that in my, que in my question. Okay. Um, and, like, yeah, we have so many solutions as far as, like, doing more with less, like biointensive gardening, permaculture, earthships, Super Adobe domes. I don't know if you've heard about those. They, it looks just like 3D printing, but with human labor. Right. <laughs> and so, like, yeah, um, we have when we have this technical equilibrium for human consumption, then we have this global standard, if you will, for all people that we can't pass. 
if we do pass this standard, then we're forcing this equilibrium out of balance and potentially disrupting or exploiting the planet's resources in a way, right? Um, is, under, is understanding this standard of living the goal of the natural law resource-based economy? If so, how can we begin to calculate this with all the negative feedback and stuff and to make it clear to those who are living above this technical standard in our current system that they are empirically harming the planet? I would also be interested if these highly technological solutions would fall, like vertical farming, would fall above or below this standard. It's also interesting to me in the resource-based economy. That's my, that's my question. Those are, those are great questions. I think you had more or less two questions there. I think the very fact that statistically we are in life support decline, uh, the sad thing is we, the very fact that we have this should be the big red flag. The problem is that no one really understands why. <laughs> as I try to describe with respect to a consumption-based economy. So if you have that education, if you're rational, you know, if you're actually thinking about stuff that's happening, I don't mean to sound condescending if you're rational, but we're not really rational because we relegate our decision-making processes to our self-interest, and we think that that's what everybody else is doing, so why would we be global conscious? Why would we be socially conscious? It doesn't get reinforced at all. Anyone that's functioning in consumption overshoot, like the multi-billionaires, they eventually through time should realize the sickness of what they're doing. It's not only harm to the planet, it's harm to it's social harm. It's a sort of social violence as that example I expressed. You know, to how far do you go with what you think you deserve? 20 mansions, 30 mansions, and of course the ridiculous example of having Africa as your backyard. Clearly that's crazy and they don't think of that that way gradually because it's so reinforced by materialism. So the answer to that question, it's an issue of education and of course showing what's happening, which is the education. So I, when I, you know, anyone I speak with of immense wealth and I, they have billions of dollars and the like, the first question is, you know, well, don't they feel any moral obligation given the suffering that's happening in the world when they hoard all that money? Don't they feel anything where they're hoarding labor, they're hoarding energy, they're hoarding food? So I think the empathic problem, it's an empathic problem. <laughs> this, this culture has, been, has, has had empathy pretty much stripped out of them. We don't identify, we think that we're in our position because of our sweat and our labor, even though frankly the vast majority of people that are rich are just lucky, is the truth of the matter. So, and people that are really, really poor are just really unlucky, because they're usually born into conditions that reinforce that. So, the, the system of maintaining, the, the maintaining this equilibrium starts with education, and then it moves into a calculated program like I described before. So I hope I'm answering your question. Uh, if you want to live in a sustainable society, this is the reasoning. If you don't, well, then we continue doing what we're doing. You know, there's, there's a value system disorder out there that's going to be very hard to overcome, but I think as the system continues to degrade and as social uprisings come forward and as the movement moves forward to speak about this, I think the value shift will slowly, will slowly take hold. Because it's going to have to. It's, the sustainability of our species basically depends on it in many ways. Thanks. So, um, uh, I got to hear that um, by... 2015, we're gonna have like around nine billion people living in the world, and um, knowing that there is already a lot of people who doesn't have a job actually, that doesn't collaborate for their society whatsoever, and in this efficient um, kind of system, will be like less and less people needed to in order to make the whole machinery work. Um, there's going to be a lot of people without doing anything, but you still need a lot of people who run the machinery by maintenance and uh, of course. on of course stuff. So who decides or what decides or how can you involve people mm. to um, make them or who's going to work, who's not going to work? Yeah, a great question. Uh, the, the, I had a whole other section to this talk that I eliminated because it was so long, and it was called the domestic economy... The domestic economy is a term used to talk about, used to describe, excuse me, what people do at home, what people do in their communities. The fact that people volunteer. In America, volunteer, even in America, it's amazing, half of the population volunteers quite often and in quite a large degree. I can't remember how many hours it was, but I believe it was something 
I think it was a number of uh, like 20 billion hours uh, a year was volunteered by people that have normal jobs that just do other things. There's tons of pro bono work happening in the legal system, happening in the medical system. There's an enormous percentage of the population globally, you'll find, that does a lot of stuff for free. Why? Because they enjoy it. They like helping people. And I think when you have a society like this where the maintenance of these machines and factories and the system itself is reduced down to, say, 5% necessary, People will not only be available to do it, they'll want to do it, and they'll want to contribute even more. I think even if you had a maintenance of 5%, you'd still have 40% wanting to contribute because they would enjoy it. They would enjoy the idea of creation and improving efficiency. They would also do other engineering feats and tasks that would, that would apply to this system through research. And that's really where this system heads. Everyone turns into a thinker. They're, no one's laboring anymore. Everyone's thinking and applying and developing. And I think that's a natural human drive. You know, there's a book called Drive, uh, no pun intended, by a guy named Dan Pink, and he did a whole series of studies that found that people in l arduous labor roles, they needed money because it was arduous and no fun. But thinking and creativity and development, it was a passion. And money actually interfered. When money was involved in the element of creation and development, it actually interfered. It lowered their efficiency and productivity. So that's a, that's a big statement towards how you can create a society that reduces all the things that we just don't like or is unhealthy and unsafe, unnecessary, I should say. I mean, 80%, I would say 80% loosely, of all the occupations in existence are not actually doing anything. They just keep money circulating. They don't have to be there. So with all that put together, I think you'd have plenty of people that would move forward. And my joke answer when someone asks me that, usually that, that question comes with a more uh, cynical tone. And they say, well, who's gonna, who's gonna run the machines? I go, I do. <laughs> and that usually shuts them up. Because do, do we have to do everything for money? Do, do we not realize that the whole world is our home? Why can't we think about our entire city in the same way we think about our home? We, we take care of our home. You, you know, you people take care of their local environment. They don't want it to be filthy and overrun with vermin and everything else. So why not have that exact same concept applied to your city? Why not have that exact same concept of caring and necessity applied to the whole world? It's not that far-fetched. And unfortunately, this system reinforces the exact opposite because of its individualism and propensity for separation. So... Thank you. Is it working? Yeah. Okay, cool. Hey, Peter. Um, hey. I'm just going to stand up because otherwise I can't see you. Um, my question is sort of more about, um, it's less about the specifics of like a technical thing and more a question of how do you see the transition, I mean, um, on a more practical level. Because, I mean, you know, to do all of these things, it seems like we need a global approach where everyone is sort of working together, all the nations, all the people, um, how do you see that practical transition? That's a very difficult question. I mean, how do you have a practical transition in a society that's working against pretty much everything by its current structure that you're trying to attain? Um, I think that there are a number of sort of protest type environments. There are a number of things that can alleviate current stress which can evolve into this system. For example, I don't know if Germany has any time banks. They're quite prolific now in small communities. Time banks are really brilliant because not only are they, are they appropriate because you're, you're not using money, which is a very unique thing. If you have a lot of poverty in the world, if you have a lot of which there's a tremendous amount, but people have skills then if you start to barter, barter through exchange for, you know, exchanging labor for labor through these mechanisms, you're getting things done in, a, in an environment if you're broke with no job, you otherwise wouldn't be able to. So imagine for a moment, if all the unemployed of the world right now, which there's no shortage of, joined a time bank, all their skill sets came together, completely absent of the market economy, there's no money involved, they're just bartering labor. And it got so efficient that people could do this a lot, and it was really efficient, and it became almost more efficient than money, where people that were in service with money they decided to move to the time banks. That's an amazing step. It would have happened like that? I'm not quite sure, but it could. I mean, if we made an efficient time bank system, uh, you'd be amazed at how fast it could conform, and people might prefer it to the market, especially if these people were interested in changing the system as we are. There are other, other issues that are happening right now that could that could also help, I should say, if you were to do a step-by-step -step process. I'm not even going to go into that, actually. You can look at it two ways. Either society accepts the path, and they go, boom, we're going to go step-by-step. -step. 
We are going to start to create automated systems for food. We're going to supply X percentage of food for this city and get it out of the way with no money directly. And you start to go step by step. You can call it socialization. I wouldn't use that term because it's historically wrong in the context I'm making. Uh, but you just keep removing the interest in having money. If you did that, you would eventually be able to evolve in a step-by-step -step way. But that would take the sanction of the entire community, and that's a very difficult thing. Um, that's pretty much all I can say. You know, I could give you all sorts of ideas that can, that can help educational processes, how you could create protest environments to draw awareness where you just stop spending money. It's a very difficult subject. Transition through technical means, through showing people what the world can be and programs to make it happen, to develop mass interest in this type of movement towards efficiency, also illuminating how inefficient we are right now is the step, which is why I'm here right now. Why GRI, the Global Redesign Institute, is a great concept. Why I'd love to see programmers start on this type of calculation process to show an interface. If you can show the world what's possible, eventually they'll, they'll take hold, especially given the pressures that are here right now. So again, <laughs> That's for, there's going to be a whole chapter in, in uh, this text that I showed about transition in different scenarios, but I don't want to waste too much time because I'm just going to keep rambling on different ideas because it's not easy to think about. But again, if people want it, it will happen. Yes. Hi there. So when I ask myself why other centralistic economic systems failed against capitalism, I think the answer lays for the most part in the lack of quick adaptability and micromanagement. Also, motivational aspects were better thought out in this capitalistic system. So regarding the new resource-based economic model, how could we address those flaws I stated before, namely the lack of quick adaptability and micromanagement? So you said critical adaptability and micromanagement? The lack of quick adaptability and micromanagement. Quick, you said quick. quick. I'm sorry. Okay. Quick. quick adaptability and micromanagement, and then you said something about incentive. Quick adaptability and micromanagement. Well, the system that I've just described is one of the most rapid feedback systems you could ever come to terms with, especially if you have a sensor system that's keeping the entire edifice informed of what's happening through production. That could be, that could be regional, such as in a country, if you want to use landmass distinctions like that. Or it could be global. And in fact, the global resource management process is very simple. It's just simply looking at the Earth as one big inventory system with sensors so we know the rates of everything that we need that's relevant for any given purpose. With that type of measurement system, you could adapt amazingly fast to any given problem. It's much faster than human, humans could, much faster than price ever could. I mean, price is ridiculously slow. It might work, but you know, we have to, you have to have inventory, you have to buy something from a store, it has to reduce to a certain amount. That feedback is sent back to the supply house. Uh, it, it takes a long time. This could be instantaneous. You'd also avoid shortages and overruns and lots of other problems, as I mentioned before. I mean, look at economic data. When you get economic data that the government or financial institutions post, it's like, a, it's like half a year old. It's really old data. None of this stuff is actually uh, in real time or even close to it. So this would move much more rapidly uh, if it's properly programmed. As far as incentive, which I believe you mentioned, uh, that is, I think, I think it's a fallacy. Uh, I think the incentive fallacy, the idea of progress through money and the pressure and the coercion, the natural coercion of society to get people to just do stuff, I don't think uh, that's, I think that's more wasteful than it is viable. Uh, what is progress? Is progress just inventing one more gadget after another? I mean, that's pretty much what we're doing at this stage. I mean, there might be certain help. It might ease our lives a little bit. I would argue in a lot of ways it's made our lives more complicated, more stressful. I was the last to move into uh, social networking or Twitter or, or I was the last, to, I'm not a Luddite, I was the last to even get a cell phone because I, I was like, wow, this, this thing's gonna just, if it's mass appeal and the, this direct communication, it's gonna distract the hell out of me. You know what I mean? It's, and as it probably does, I mean, attention deficit's off the chart these days. I wonder why. You know, we're completely over, overburdened with information now, which I don't know if that's good or bad. It's a hard thing to say. But what is progress? Progress means you're creating things that ease your life, ease your lives, and find stability, and maintains a low stress, and obviously creates happiness, not some impulsive need to keep moving and doing things. Now that aside, I think once these kind of excuse me, once these kind of uh, efficiency notions come forward, I think there's a great drive in almost every human being to want to create and to have an effect. Now I say have an effect. I mean, if you want to create something for selfish sale, that gives you sustenance. That's great. But if you talk to any elderly person and you ask them what they really appreciate in their lives, they'll always tell you at least nine out of ten times it was what they did for other people. 
we have an intrinsically social nature, and I think that this needs to be amplified rather than suppressed. And I think incentive, uh, if we can realize that what we're doing is helping others, not just myself, I think that that incentive alone really will drive people. As it already does today, because we have millions and millions of people that volunteer all the time, pro bono work. Why? Because they want to help. There's a deep urge to help. It's a part of our social nature. Um, you, al you already mentioned a, a word, education. I think that's a very important word, um, which I don't see addressed a lot in, in within the concept of the Zeitgeist movement. Um, <coughs> Do you have any clear ideas on this? Because uh, obviously, if we go through 13 years plus schooling, you know, that degrades our brains to functioning rather than creative thinking and even understanding concepts like this, I think it will be a big problem to even get ahead pragmatically. That's I, I agree. Um, obviously, the whole movement's based on education, but you're referring to institutional education. Yeah, I don't, I and no one in the movement has control over how education is sanctioned in our, in our uh, heavily regulated educational institutions. Uh, one of our main uh, lecture members, James Phillips, he works with children right now in educational circles. I think he's had affiliations with some institutions to talk about ideas like this. So there's people that are trying to do their best with that, but I agree with you. Uh, education in the future won't be won't have anything to do with this post-World War II factory assembly ethic that we have that runs throughout. How we influence that comes down to how much information we spread. I've get, I get lots of emails from teachers in, in college universities. They, lo they show my films. They Engineering students, uh, philosophy is a big one. They love showing the films. So, I mean, it's up to the teacher, I guess, in a lot of ways, if they can control their curriculum. But other than that, it's, you know, it's just a process of getting as much out there as we can and hoping that it takes hold. Luckily, I will say, though, sustainability has become very popular. So there are huge sustainability educational facilities out there now. You know, they talk about sustainable design, and that's a great first step. That wasn't there 30 years ago. You know, so that's, that's a really big, it's almost trendy. <laughs> the, the idea of, of green is now very trendy, uh, for better or for worse, because now marketing loves to talk about it, but yet they're not generally doing anything that's actually sustainable. They just make to make people think they are and charge a lot more when they do, because everything that's sustainable and green is much more expensive than everything that's normal. Uh, only the rich can be sustainable, apparently. <laughs> Thank you. Hi. Hi. Uh, I have a million questions, but I will try to break down to two. Sorry, I think there is a, some echo. So first thing, uh, I really enjoyed the part about the energy program and uh, how you show through calculations. I mean, there are many people also sustain the same theory, professors from the university, people working in the field directly. And basically, with each of these uh, energy source, you can uh, provide sustainability. And uh, you right. don't need uh, to go on with the system we are, we are relying on uh, in this moment. Absolutely not. I am a dreamer as much as you are in this sense, but I don't want to remain a dreamer as much as you don't. So what the question is, uh, how do you see this realized? Like, how, who is going to do this? <laughs> so the, the thing is, uh, uh, there are people trying to solve the third world debt, for example, there are the, the, the theory for Stiglitz, uh, and this is not really far structurally for what you, for what you propose. And they are, they are trying to go through the institutions. So they are not trying to change the structure of capitalism. They are trying to use it in a good way. What, what, do, you, what do you answer about that relating to the energy program, uh, but also like to, to, to the food program or to, to other uh, aspects that you, okay. that you touched? Well, the, um, the second question, with people that are using institutional means to try and solve their problems, I mean, obviously, I don't, I don't it, the answer is that, well, people just do what they have to do to the highest degree they can within the system. But at some point, it's going to be found that going to the International Monetary Fund, when your country is bankrupt, to take loans at interest while they manipulate your resources and infrastructure for their corporate constituency, it's not going to be very, very appeasing for most countries, which is why a lot of countries have rebelled. Uh, so the whole thing is a scam on that level for debt, but that's another conversation. There are tons of non, uh, excuse me, NGOs out there. There are tons of, in fact, if you look at the rate of increase of non-governmental organizations or non-profits related to human rights and sustainability, it's almost exponential in, in the 20th and 21st century. If that isn't an indicator of something, I don't know what is. 
Uh, it's ridiculous how many of these institutions are there, and they're trying to help. But my big thesis, as, as I stated at the beginning, is that it's only going to go so far. There's a glass ceiling. So obviously, they have to do something else. And it's again, I, I hate to be redundant, but it's an awareness issue. I would love to see a country, and this I had this conversation earlier. I'm, I'm going to make a point now to answer your first question. Uh, this, I think, might help a little bit as far as change. You know, this, is, this is the way I think transition, in fact, could happen. I'm, I'm surprised I didn't think of it just a moment ago. Do excuse me, I'm a bit tired. Um, I think at some point on the planet, because of ephemeralization, because of doing more and more with less and less, some country that has increasingly had less have it, has increasingly ha having less need to engage in globalization, meaning they have so many resources on their in their country coupled with the efficiency that they've been able to create through ephemeralization, that they will realize that they, can, they do no longer have to be involved in the global economy, and they'll no longer have to be subject to the things that the global economy does in the mass global market system. And they will realize the negativities, and somebody will come along, and believe me, it will be as propagandized as possible when someone does this. Look at any, look at any nation that's tried to be independent. So it's not an easy thing to do. But they will probably do it eventually because they will contain and they'll close themselves off and they will be sustainable using these methods without any external interference. That would be an amazing step. Imagine if a South American country blocked themselves off, I don't say block, but decided to engage no commerce ever. They don't need it. They're off the grid from the world economy. And they set the standard because they move into a sustainable economy. They move into exactly what the world should do based on these principles. That would be an amazing first step. And I think that's highly probable. Um, I think that some countries are going to get that idea and they're going to do it and they're going to get it done because the technological means are pointing to that direction where you no longer need to rely on this vast interdependence. I'm not saying that countries should do that in the sense that we should be all to be detached, not at all. We need global consciousness, we need global connection. But that might be a good first step to show that you don't have to be reliant on these international institutions anymore which are inherently corrupt. As far as your first question about energy, you know, there are plenty of people out there that are engaging in, with high diligence in the science community for energy. Uh, the problem with what's happened in the investment community is, um, see if I can explain this, everything that happens in its creation of, say, renewable energy, say, solar energy. Uh, we've had solar power cells for a long, long time, long, long time. And yet they've only inched into efficiency, inch, 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 inch. And they've been ridiculously expensive, ridiculously expensive because of various investment pressures, various production limitations. No one said, okay, let's just apply the science right now to the highest degree possible and do it. No one said that because they can't. It's not profitable. They have to make it profitable to begin with across the entire stage of development. So why is it that only 80% you know, possible efficiency now with solar radiation capture, capturing the entire spectrum of light now, even infrared, and we only have 18% in commercial solar panels sold now, on average. Why is that? Is it because they can't do anything more than 80%? <laughs> no. It's because they can't make the profit leap. They can't do it. So imagine, for example, the, atom the atomic bomb, which, of course, is a horrible thing. But what did they do when they made this? They got 10,000, they got 100,000 scientists, put them in one big facility, and maybe not 100, there's other people, there's like 50,000 scientists, I can't remember the number. Anyway, there's an, a large number of people that they put together in this facility to push this thing forward. There was no market system. <laughs> there was nothing to influence them. They produced that thing rapidly. If, if you had to bring the atom, atomic bomb to market, it would have taken decades and decades and decades and decades. You had little atomic bombs and then... Uh, so... Energy is the pro is the same, is, it has the same problem. It's going through this investment nonsense and it's going through the profit filter. And I don't have a solution other than let's get rid of the profit system and get this mechanism going. I can't tell you how it can happen otherwise, so I hope that helps, but it can be done. The potential's there, and we just need to bypass investment and just do it. Maybe some massive grant from a very, a very rich institution. Maybe some college could, I, I would love to see a university think tank. This is something you don't see much today. Every single university with all their resources, because kids have the one luxury in this economy, they don't have to work. They're there to learn, right? They're paying a bunch of money to learn, <laughs> but they're there to learn, at least in, in most cases. Maybe not in Europe, you don't pay as much as, as, as we do in the States, which is ridiculous. And you get them all to work on the same project. 
entire international university collaboration towards the advancement of geothermal technology to its highest efficiency. If you did that, that would be unbelievable. I don't know of many government, excuse me, many grants or, or projects that are like that right now, but I think that would also be an amazing step. Because once you show the public, once again, what's possible and what's not happening, they're going to say, why, why can't we have this? Why can't we have this? And the market's going to scratch its head and have to figure out how to do a runaround and maybe bring it to fruition faster than usual. So I hope that explains. hope that helps. Thank you. Hi. Hey. Um, yeah, first of all, first of all, uh, thanks for your work and your inspiration. And my question, you, um, you talked, talked a lot of uh, calculation and, and, and technology, but I'm rather uh, interested in psychology. So, um, um, yeah, regarding uh, different worldviews, different value systems, if you, if, if you want to, um, uh, it's hard to convince people just by argument. Um, sometimes I think you're fam familiar with this problem. Sure. And so, um, how is this? Are the different world views? Uh, how can you or how can we include the, uh, them into this uh, new economic model? So you mean people that are more influenced by emotional or psychological appeals? How do we assist them to understand this? If I understand your question, is that right? Um, now, regarding that, um, we had a question about um, about. Uh, um, what was it? Um, uh, considering that there are people w w who believe believe in God or something, okay. yes. And so I, I would consider that those people, um, not not uh, to make it simple, to put it in a simple way, those people have a different kind of understanding than maybe people are sitting in this room. So um, that's they, a yeah, that's they tough. Have, yeah, they have. Well, they have some, I would. Yes. I would look at that the same way I look at people that are very dedicated to market enthusiasm, mm. yes. that believe in the market, that think market is a system of natural liberty and all the, all the classical economic stuff that we continue to read about. So re religious thought, so what you're referring to are thought processes yes. that are antagonistic towards the model. They have some type of moral assumption and they think that this model interferes and is amoral in some way. I think that's what you're saying. Yes, for instance. Yeah, yeah I, I'm, I, that's, that's hard because you have to take it on a per case basis. If you speak with people that are deeply religiously minded, that have a, a very direct assumption uh, that causality comes from a higher order, mm -hmm. that's a hard thing to deal with when you talk about sustainability and efficiency protocols and the laws of nature. You know, it's very <laughs> clearly... Um, but, uh, but you can try another appeal. Most, most religions have moral orders, or actually most market systems have moral orders too. So just like thou shalt not kill. Okay, well then if you want a system where people don't kill each other, let's make resources a little bit more available to everybody so they don't have the pressure to do so. If you argue like that with someone with their moral principles, you might be able to get them on your side. Or if I talk to a market economist that really believes in laissez-faire economics, and they think everything should be free and get rid of the state, uh, you, you, say, you, you, you agree with them and say, well, yeah, you know, it'd be great to see the power of that state gone, but how do we do it? And you take them through the train of thought that the fact that the state is, an, is in absolute ourobora, is absolute in continuum with the market as a regulatory uh, entity. It has to exist. If they don't understand that, that's another problem, because I run into a lot of people that don't understand any of that. They just block it out, which is another problem. That's called mind lock. And all I can say to those that <laughs> encounter mind lock is move on. <laughs> uh, there's a lot of low-hanging fruit out there. Don't torture yourselves <laughs> by, by addressing the most stubborn minds. So it's an issue of relating to values. If you can find common ground with the people you're speaking with, then you go that route. So hope that helps. Thank you. Um. I'd like you to elaborate more um, on the stability issue because uh, I don't think you uh, addressed uh, all of m uh, the aspects which I meant. Uh, personally, I think that the stability issue is uh, much more important than all the technical feasibility uh, problems because uh, technically uh, there is no doubt that uh, it can be achieved, but. Um, the stability is which bothers me. Uh, let me give an example. Um, I don't think that uh, m most uh, waste is due to bad intentions, but uh, due to negligence. Uh, for example, if I uh, design some system and uh, I design it in an incorrect way, and uh, I made a, I make a mistake, which um, then. Uh, 
breaks some very, uh, let me not say uh, expensive equipment because uh, there won't be any money, but uh, equipment which has a lot of resources in it. Uh, and my mistake could uh, possibly negate all my work contribution, uh, all my life contribution, which I um, did. So uh, uh, what would be the mechanism that uh, would um, enforce discipline uh, and uh, punish negligence? Because uh, uh, it's not uh, necessarily that uh, people will just be very greedy and try to have possessions, but they, they will be um, uh, negligence, uh, uh, negligent in the process of creating. Okay, well that, that gets to the heart of, again, this program that I described when it comes to design efficiency. So if you want to refer to the process of good creation and assure that that creation meets integrity, there are two filters. One filter are these algorithmically programmed sustainability protocols and, sustain, excuse me, and efficiency protocols, which are very tangible and can be represented in quanti quantifiable terms, and anything proposed can run through this type of filtration. And the second is other human input in many ways, which is why I talked about that system as being an open source system. So <clears throat> if people are active in this process of engineering and sharing information, and someone submits something that the, the AI algorithm happens to miss, others reviewing these concepts well, might just find it because they happen to be familiar with that particular inefficiency or problem, or as you say, negligence. I mean, negligence, I think, is, might not be the right word in this context. I don't know why anyone would even engage in this system if they intended to be negligent. It's not like the market system where you can be negligent because you're always trying to get money so you can make stuff that doesn't really work or ne and never think it through. You just get it to market as fast as possible, just like the first of anything that's made usually breaks down and has all sorts of problems. That would consider that to be negligence, but I don't know why anyone would be negligent uh, in this system. Why would you waste your time to be negligent, meaning be literally inefficient on purpose, to be lazy? So I hope that still answers your question. If not, uh, please elaborate more so. And you also talked a moment about a, neglig a negligent system causing other problems. I consider the entire apparatus of the market as one negligent system, if you want to use that type of definition, producing lots of other artifacts that affect us negatively. But that, that might be an abstraction. Uh, I wasn't quite sure if that's what you meant in your opening point. Okay. I hope that helps. because the, the, That's the, what the whole point of this system is, is to avoid negligence, if you want to use that term arbitrarily, to avoid anything that has a negative consequence. That's the whole point of this entire process. Apart from making it an absolutely participatory economic system, where is, there's no dictatorship, there's no people sitting behind the curtain deciding what to do. It is, it is set in motion through automation, through the basic laws of nature and general social consensus. All right, we, we have three questions left right here. Okay. All right. <coughs> uh, hi. Um, do you see any, any flows in the, in the system, in the resource-based economy, economy that the, the Zeitgeist movement advocates for? And if not, um, if it's too early to foresee some flaws in a system, um, what do you think are the main challenges? Are, are there any threats that could terminate spreading the word further? If you know what I mean. Okay, uh, well the second question, clearly no large power structure has dealt kindly with any mass of people moving towards change that would alter that power establishment. So one of the beauties of the movement is that it's holographic. We're not trying to get people to throw bricks through windows. We are simply presenting information, design ideas, and projects that people can think about to make a better world under the obvious logical uh, conclusion that the current order is not going to function. Now, I don't know how you work against that except creating propaganda, which has already started towards the movement. It's been done historically. But I believe that if we maintain a very rigid technical worldview, that there's no way you can attack this idea from traditional political routes. You can, you can blackball it, you can call it names, you can try to create this air of illusion, you can, you can do things like that, but the information holds strong. As this type of thinking moves forward, 
uh, I think that it's going to attract the attention of many prominent people that see it not only for the broad view, but as just completely logical and, 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 and obvious and rational and humane and, and sustainable. I've, I spoke with somebody that was a CEO of an engineering company, and he affiliated with Siemens, and he told me that his idea was to create a solar, his, he was an engineer who was creating solar panels, was to make solar panels put them in a rental system to force his organization, this is in short, to be required to maintain the highest standards of production to assure that they constantly work. What that means is that you're taking the liability uh, of a good breaking down and bringing it back to the manufacturer. Uh, this is a, a very good, actually a very great sustainable uh, transition step. So if something goes wrong with anything that we buy, we're not just out in the woods, and especially if our warranty is gone. Uh, you, everything is, goes back because it's their responsibility. If you, had a, if you had a corporate mindset that had everything be their responsibility and they're going to be responsible for everything that happens to that good, you'd have a very different world. And that's kind of sort of the underpinning of, of how this type of new arrangement works out as an access society. Why would someone abuse goods in this society when they know that everyone else has to deal with the same thing? The beauty of this society, and I'm going to answer your other point in a second, is that it takes self-interest and it combines it with social interest in one unit, and it also combines with ecological interest, which I would say is almost tandem to social interest. So you're creating one mechanism. How many people would go in their home, go down into their building, in their apartment, and just start ripping out all the fuses? Just for fun. Why? Because they'd have their power out, right? Why would someone hack into a system like this and try to mess it up when they are gonna, they're just gonna hurt themselves because everything that they get comes from this system? Why would you try to mess something? The whole idea of vandalism and this, this I call it a blowback, because that's what it is. Uh, it's all this angst we have in society where people throw bricks through windows, where they, you know, they do lots of things. It's because they don't have a sense that it comes back to them, except for punishment, which doesn't even really work. So you hurt the society, you hurt yourself. Self-interest becomes social interest. And that's the powerful mechanism. Now, as far as your, your first question, what kind, of things, um, would, what kind of things do I see as a weakness in this system? I think the problem with this system is that you have to have different levels of relationships. There's no one relationship. In the price and market system, there's one relationship. Anyone can buy anything if they have the power. If you don't have the power, obviously, you're out of luck. You don't have the purchasing power. But in this system, you can basically buy just about anything. If you want to do anything, if you have enough money, you can do it. And that's why the elite are what they are, why they love this system so much, or the 1%, as Occupy would say. In, in a resource-based economic model, there's no one system. The system of land management is another subject that I didn't talk upon. How do you create a system of shared land resources when clearly land is very finite? You have to create a value system orientation for that. You have to create, first of all, you have a society that has no labor centralization, right? So you don't have to worry about everyone being in one town in a, in a, in a metropolitan you know, center because they all have to go to the same job every day, crowding into streets, all of that stuff is gone. The freedom of people to move around would be vast. Maybe, just maybe, people wouldn't want to have one homestead. Maybe they could move around all over the world and share different, different places to live. Uh, the whole world becomes your home. This type of mobility and travel and exploration, I think, would come natural, frankly. It already is. We're just, we don't do it because we don't have the money to do it. So you create a system of shared regions. You have regions that are designated for certain purposes. If you want to put on a concert, there's regions that have already been created that are conducive to that. And that comes through public consensus. That can, that can be valued in different ways. If someone on this side of the planet, uh, it, if someone on this side of the planet in the northern hemisphere wants to put in a stadium, someone in the southern hemisphere might have less value of input because they don't engage it. So you could have a system where people are regionally valued based on their contribution in the democratic process to figure out where things go. In a more technical context, if you look at the order of, of society, how do you arrange things to begin with? There's actually a logic to the way a city would, would unfold. So how do you decide what goes anywhere? Well, where's energy? Where's the highest conducive for energy? If a city is conducive like Iceland for, for, uh, for uh, geothermal, they have to be where the plate play tectonic plates meet, and they have to be where the most shallow distances are. Boom. You have a logical distinction of where these plants go. You have centers of where people already exist. Boom. You have a logical uh, calculation of where energy distribution needs to go. You have the facilities that I mentioned, the proximity strategy. Uh, you have a logical calculation of where all the distribution of recycling and, and production facilities go. So it comes self-evident as you move forward. And there are certain variances that I think uh, will emerge as well. 
So I, do I consider that really a problem? Not as much. But I consider it to be difficult to explain, you know, because everyone's so used to the market system. So anyway, awful, awfully long-winded today. <laughs> Sorry. Okay, we have another question from the internet. Uh, Yagi from Poland is asking a question about invigilation. Probably you've heard about Mazdar City. There are going to be uh, many detectors to control power, water usage, etc. The less power or water you use, the lower the bill you pay. It raises the question about privacy. The quote-unquote system knows everything about you. There's no place for anonymity. As far as I know, uh, the RBE City uh, will be going to have similar detectors to control demand and supply. So how do you see the privacy in an RBE? I don't know where that idea came from. I mean, if you have a system that's technically oriented to manage resources, and you don't have to track them, it's not like someone gets a computer and there's a chip in it and someone has to know where it is at all times. Why would you need that? I mean, there's no incentive for people to do a lot of things that they do in the current system as far as abuse. This isn't, this isn't a loss of privacy-based system. There's no reason for that. There's no reason to have cameras in every corner. Now, I will say there's a, there is a merit of tracking statistically things, excuse me, tracking things statistically. That's not necessarily privacy uh, issues. I, I know a study that was done, an experiment uh, in inner, inner city circumstances where people were paid, of course, because uh, they're broke, to wear different sensors on their bodies to provide feedback of their environment. That's actually a very powerful concept. Imagine if each one of us was relaying feedback of our environment a certain way to a localized mainframe that could engage certain threats. So, for example, it could sense smoke, smoke from a fire that maybe hasn't been seen yet. There's a lot of, a lot of things to be said about the benefits of having an engaged, interactive society. But tracking as far as privacy, as far as privacy violation, I think it's been highly exaggerated in the world today. In, in the world today, privacy is very needed because everyone's corrupt. <laughs> there I said it. People are so obsessed with privacy because they're doing bad things all the time. Everyone is. Now, I mean, you could talk about privacy in other means, which are clearly viable. No one wants to be stared in when they're sleeping and things like that. That's a whole different level. And no one wants to be tracked for the sake of advertising, which is what is happening right now across the world, where people can manipulate. The real danger in a, in a competitive market environment is because there's a higher echelon of people. If they're tracking your every move, that means they know what you're doing. That means they have control over you if you ever get in trouble or in the way. Uh, that's a, that, is a, that is the antithesis, that is the problem, and that's exactly what this system removes, in part. Okay. Uh, will the idea of having a government or something of the kind in this kind of uh, resource-based economic system will, will be removed? Government becomes a series of sensors and a series of monitors. The people that really engage industry and monitor what's happening is the government. Uh, there's only a few exceptions when it comes to say, as I had mentioned, how you think about institutions to protect people in the whole of society. Clearly, if you have an institution for mental health, someone has to be at some level to engage that. And you, you wouldn't call that government, they're just, they, they're not, they're participating in a particular layer that relates to the whole of society. Government is an issue, a system of regulation. What defines government is regulation, which of course the market has to have. In this system, the regulation is technical. And the regulation is defined by the incentive and sustainability, excuse me, the the, uh, the sustainability efficiency protocols at the very core. So in that, you have a natural process that weeds out things when it comes to production, and you don't need anything regarding uh, basic security because there's no incentive to move forward in that way. Uh, regulation and government control uh, is as minuscule as possible. I'm not saying it disappears. I, I would never say that because there might be some kind of larger order, order organization, say, that deals with resource management or, say, massive civil threats, or I should say massive nat natural threats. I mean, we just had an enormous strike in the Philippines from a, a, that's killed 10,000 people. In order to deal with something like that, you need an international organization that's ready to move and to help people. So they have to be ready. If you want to call that government, you can. I don't necessarily say it would be. I'd say it's still localized. I'd say it's a... You know, if you look at a whole sensor system for Earth, there's going to be people that have to monitor it. It goes straight into the system. There's always going to be small problems that happen. They're not managing people, though. They're managing the process. So I can't drill it in enough. It's a process management system. What's in charge is the system itself, not people. That's it? That's it. Whew, goodness, I'm out of wind. And I want to, I really want to thank.
the Berlin team. And of course, thank you all for coming from where you have. I really, really appreciate it, seriously. And I also want to thank the Berlin team and Frankie for all the, all the great work, because I know it's a pain to put this stuff on. So thank you all so much.